at a time. Um, and Alan, I would just also like to um, note that um, um, typically that if you could just note that um, people shouldn't use um, members of the public shouldn't use the chat button to make their public comments. If anyone from them, any members of the public want to make a public comment, they need to be recognized by the chair to make that comment. Um, so, um, okay, they've been told. So, not hearing any members of the public for things that are not on our agenda, we'll move to the item that I previously called. Um, someone representing Pioneer Development. Um, you're on mute, Danny. Sorry, I don't do the Zoom very often. Um, John, did John make it onto the call? John, up oh, there you are, I see you, but I can't hear you. You're muted. I'm going to let um, John just give a quick summary of the changes to the set and then Jeff and I will be available for additional questions. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Um, well, basically we had to readdress the stormwater. Could, could, could you just identify yourself, please? Uh, John Wallen, uh, engineer with the engineer group. Thank you. Um, we all set? Yep. Okay, um, we uh, <clears throat> went back and readdressed the stormwater to accommodate uh, or mitigate storms all the way up to a hundred year storm uh, down to the 10 year storm level or just below what the 10 year storm level would be. Uh, that would be uh, draining into the city's pipe uh, once the city replaces their pipe. Um, what that did was it changed the uh, Coltec system that we had underground in the front of the building from I think it was five units to begin with to 32 units. Uh, so it got significantly bigger, uh, but it was able to, to uh, bring the flows all down uh, quite a bit as you might imagine. Uh, that change was made. We did add a, uh, a fence between the two pieces of property uh, requested by uh, a homeowner and we also added a tree by the trash container uh, near the turnaround and that's about it yes any any other um, presentation by the applicant or we're done uh, the, the only yeah, so we, we submitted a summary of site plan changes, which hopefully you had a chance to look at. But the only other major thing to note is that we did add the turning radius to the lower left side of the site plan. So you can see, um, you know, how cars would get out on the property. Would, would you be able to um, put that up on the screen so we can see it? Um, Carolyn, do you do happen that. to have that? Are you able to? Yeah, uh, well, I can screen share. I can allow you to screen share or um, let's see. Let me just do this. Um, um, and which, um, can you confirm again, Alan, what sheet you wanted to have me put up? Showing the turnaround that was just referred to. Oh, that was sure. Added. Yep. Yep. On, on sheet two, I believe. Yep. Hold on, I'll, I'll open one here. Verify it. Okay. Um. I don't see it on sheet two. So let's see where it is. Um, okay, um, yeah, it is on two. I can, um, I will screen share that. Um, 
here. Um, is that showing up on the screen for you all? Yes, for okay. me. So it's in this area here. So here's the end of the street. Here's the existing two family. And so they have the um, turning movements here. It might be a little more visible if you zoom right into that area. So um, that's it here and that's the corner of, I can just go up here, it's this area um, right in here. Shown right there. That came about as a question. Somebody asked if we were able to turn around without backing into the neighbor's driveway. I personally have a hard time figuring out what it's depicting, but that does show that it won't, they won't back into the neighbor's driveway. Yeah. So he, here's the, this heavy line is the property line. And so if a car were parked here in this first space, they'd be uh, making this movement here to this line and then coming back this way. Hmm. <coughs> Got it. Uh, John Wallen here again. I, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, there's one other change to this. We took the pole out of the corner and uh, going to leave the electric service where it is and, and run it underground from this building to the next building. There was a pole near the, the corner where that car was turning around, right where the last car was parked. On the last plane. Right here. Yeah. Yep. So it will connect here. It's going to stay right where it was. And then it'll um, be underground. The underground from there. I'm sorry, where was it? Or where is it at present? It's it's now it, right where it exists today. It's yep. overhead going up, going Connect into the there. building. And that will go underground here. Are you all um, all set with this plan? So is, is the um, presentation completed? That's it for changes. No, no, no questions from board members for the applicant at the moment? Okay. Uh, are there members of the public that would like to uh, speak to the issue? If so, um, join, the, join the proceedings and give your name and address. Yes, Claudia. Just unmute. Hi. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Yes, this is Claudia Chirichini from 32 Hampton Street. I have a question about the um, sewer line and the need for an easement or the proposal um, from DPW of relocation. I can probably speak to that, what, our, what the plan is. I don't know if you can hear me still. Yes. yes. 
Okay. Um, John Wallen again. Uh, we don't know exactly where that sewer line is. We know it's in the vicinity of the property line. And our thought was to dig it up. And once we expose it, we can determine if it's on uh, 36's property or 32's or if it shares the two. And the desire would be to move it onto, uh, onto 32 so that it does not need an easement. If it's too far onto 36, then we would request an easement so that it could be accessed. I met the foreman out there when he marked it and he wasn't, it's so close to the line, we don't know what, which side it's on and, and their methods of marking it aren't accurate as a surveyor might be once we see what, where the pipe is. Yeah, if I could just jump in for one second. If, if we find that her sewer line is on our property, I think, you know, rather than dig up her whole property in order to relocate it, which we could do, um, but that would be more disruptive. It would probably be easiest for us to just provide the easement to her. Uh, but if we find that for some reason it does need to be moved, you know, we'll do that. So the easement would need to be provided by you to me? Exactly, yes, because part of your sewer line may be on our property. I see. But we don't, we don't really know yet. I see. Did you have any other questions or was that it, Claudia? Yes, I cannot, I mean, I don't understand. So we will have to, to see. I mean, I understand what has been explained. I'm not sure I understand the implication, but we will have to see. It will require digging it up. Uh, well, it'll require excavating 36 Hamden's property. And if we don't find the sewer line, it's safe to assume it's on your property and that the marking is just too close to the line. All right. Um. Any other questions from other members of the public? Sorry, I. This is Ruth. Um, I, I don't have um, the. I'm having troubles with my Zoom and can't see the whole screen, so I apologize if I'm butting in. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so a couple questions I had. I noticed that the tree that is being put in as a replacement is a dogwood, which I think is usually a very small tree compared to the very large, um, old, beautiful tree that's there. Is there any requirement to replace a tree with a similar similar size tree? I can answer um, that if you'd like. I, I don't know if I should ask all my questions at once or what you want to do. Yeah, that would be best to just ask them all at once and the board can okay. determine. Okay, um, and, and then um, the other thing is, I think in the last meeting we heard that um, the developer is proposing to do a modular construction, not unlike the one that's at the old vet um, hospital site. And um, I, I uh, am concerned that, you know, half of Hamden Street, which is the legal size of her entry uh, on the property, is, is probably only eight feet wide, something like that. And, and I, I'm wondering how the developer proposes to bring in this huge modular without encroaching on neighbors' properties. Um, and then in, just in terms of the, the turning radius, uh, it was, it's been my understanding that you actually had to have more like um, you know, 20 feet or something like that of, of um, a, a, a 10 foot radius and then, you know, closer to 20 feet on either side. And I, I just don't see that. I mean, the, it is possible that a car might be able to back out there, but it's, you know, the car drawn is all the way to the left side of the parking lot. It literally touches the end of the property line. And 
you know, right now Ian is happy, the abutter is happy to continue to share that driveway, but should somebody else move in and decide to put in a fence or a tree right there, um, I, I, I guess I do question whether or not that radius is really enough. And, and even though it's possible, will it be used that way? It, um, uh, I still maintain that, uh, and, and I guess the third, the fourth thing, and I'll try and be brief, is is just revisiting um, the notion of having less units on this property. It, it occurs to me that the most, um, the thing that causes the most problems with this design is the number of cars on the site, and having just two single units would reduce the number of cars by two, and would. Uh, um, eliminate a lot of the issues um, that have been brought up by residents. Um, uh, yeah, so. Would the applicant like to respond to those questions? Uh, I can respond to the turning radius when you're when you get there. Should we take them in order? There's first the tree question. Carolyn, did you want to? Yeah, I mean the the tree the tree um, ordinance has a replacement requirement. The applicant can choose whatever trees are on the city's tree list, um, and then whatever difference there is in the total inches planted versus the total inches removed according to the formula, um, the applicant would pay into the tree fund if they couldn't plant all the species on site. As we have. Asked me to pick a different species. I, we selected that because it matched the other side, so it seemed to have some symmetry about it. But if, if a larger tree species that grows to be taller is desired, we could, we could do that. It's not, it's, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, what, what was the next question? If someone can remind me. Are we, is the turning radius was the next one. John, do you want to address that? Yeah, the the, uh, the turning radius um, is designed for an automobile. It is not designed for a tractor trailer. Um, and uh, that's basically it. You're right. It is designed for an automobile and not a, not a, uh, you know, an 18 wheeler to go around. Um, as far as backing up and just touching the property line, the reality is that's the end of the street. So it's actually twice as wide as what is shown there that that property line is not on the neighbor's driveway. It's only halfway to it. So the reality is people will probably back up halfway across the street and, and pull out. Um, they will probably not um, uh, back as tightly as that is because it just doesn't make sense when you're there doing it. The other thing to note is that because of the way this road was uh, abandoned by the city and then reconfiguring the property lines, both properties do cross each other's one when you're leaving and one when you're coming in. Uh, so if you put up a fence, you would have to drive down and then dog leg over to get around that fence. It still would be possible, but again, it just wouldn't make sense to do because um, the actual frontage is just the road width which is two cars wide. Uh, so right now, if a fence went up, then then the neighbor across the street, and I think that's two, is that the address of that one? I don't, I'll close my drawing here. Reed Street, I think it's two Reed Street. Yeah, two Reed Street would have to pull out of their driveway and drive up and around the end of a fence if it were put on there, hypothetically and then get into the right side of the road lane. So the real problem is just in that the road was abandoned too short uh, to accommodate this stuff going in and out of the driveways. The driveway is technically at the intersection of the road and the north boundary line. It, it's not really, it's not really uh, because you can't pull out of the, the western boundary line and hit the road in either case. Um, although in both cases, they both share it uh, like it's a common area. 
so. Yeah, I, I guess, but even if, even though right now that person can't pull out of the driveway, if, if Ian sells the house and somebody else decides they don't want the driveway, they're going to park in the street, they want to put up a fence, they want to, I mean, it feels like you guys have to be able to design within your boundaries. What we're showing is that you can do that because then with somebody backing up would have to back up and they would hit the fence if they went any further. So they would have to stop before they hit the fence and turn out onto the road. So what about a delivery truck or, a, you know, um, what do they do? They're going to stop at the end of the driveway, just like any rural driveway anywhere. And you think they'll do that? Well, I'm sure they won't plow through somebody's fence if there's a fence there. The well, I mean, is right it, now they can get in there. We're talking about possibility of building a fence between the properties, and I don't see that as a logical thing somebody would do. Uh, well, but privacy, right? Somebody might decide they want to put up a front privacy hedge or um, some trees or something like that. And I just think you can't assume that you're going to have that half of that driveway. Yeah. That's the point is we're not assuming it. We're saying if he decides that he would like to put up a fence or a hedge or something, we can manage the property's fine. Yeah, Jeff. I just wanted to, I would just like to point in that the neighbor has the similar mirror image situation. And so ostensibly they're backing on to 36 right now to turn and go. So if they can right. maintain it on their property, then so can we. On 36 and if a right. fence were there it would make both driveways difficult but they don't have eight eight parking spots you know they they actually only park the one, one car but only the one at the end is the issue the others the others are far easier to turn how how would the second car in turn it it will have once it backs out it has a longer straightaway and it can actually be it can actually reach the um, right-of-way at an angle I don't think I follow you there. It seems like it's coming down the exact same path that that first, that, that one car you drew is Starting, going the, the circle shows the car at the end from a parking situation backing around and it can work on our site. Uh, the second car in would have, a, that circle would actually move over. So the, the, it would make it far easier. But I think you've proposed to have two park parking spots right next to the house. So they can't go any closer to, they can't go any further down towards the meadows. They, the, there's no room to back in is my point. I, I guess I just worry, you know, it's great if everybody has a, a Mini Cooper, but what if somebody comes and has a y Yukon or a, you know, um, or a delivery truck. The day we last talked, actually, my neighbor videotaped a truck trying to pull out of that driveway now as it exists without three extra units and without all the parking spots. And he struggled to get out of that site. So eight They're cars are not going to be able to go on the property. So I'm just going to interject that I think that the plans show that the turning radius meets the, um, is in compliance with the zoning ordinance for what a, a car needs for turning radians out of the lot. So I think what the applicants are saying is that in the current configuration, um, users might behave differently, but um, zoning doesn't actually require them to build in any additional space beyond what's currently shown on these revised plans. Okay. And are, th are there specs that we can look up somewhere to look up what... You, you just got muted again. Um, I can just say that, you know, you, you have to have 18 feet of backup space. So um, if, uh, and many, in most places, probably further up on um, Hamden Street, delivery trucks don't come in everybody's driveway. They just pull out on the street. So my guess is that would be the same situation here. They just pull up in the, uh, in the street, unload whatever they're delivering, and then back up the street. Um, that's how it's done throughout, you know, most of the city anyway, but there is a, you know, cars need 18 feet of backup space or they can back out onto the, you know, for single family homes, obviously people back out onto the street and they use the street as their backup. This happens to be a private end of the, of, um, what leads into the public way. 
And, and so you're saying there are 18 feet behind the car, um, that first car, to be able to pull out? That's a 24-foot radius that's shown. OK. OK, any other questions, comments? I live at 2 Reed Street. Um, right. Yes, hi. Would you give your name and address, please? My name is Ian Stewart. I live at 2 Reed Street. What? Don't we know him? Who? Yeah, that was Ian. <laughs> yes, hello. There he is. <laughs> Am I there? Yeah, that's you, you are. My driveway is immediately across um, Hamden Street from the new development and will be directly impacted by whatever happens there. And one of my main concerns, besides all of the other concerns that have been stated, is snow removal. And I don't want snow plowed into my front yard, which has happened before, because there's no other place to put it. And um, I'm just wondering what's going to happen with that. Um, Hello? Yes, I, I guess I can address that. You know, we had a pretty extensive conversation at the last meeting about this city snow removal issue. And, you know, it continues to be the same, our same position that the city, you know, needs to treat this street the way they treat every other street in the city. Um, that they, they can't be, you know, leaving snow in inappropriate places. They need to distribute it across the street the same way they do everywhere else. So we're gonna to have to work with DPW and the folks that are plowing this portion of the street to, you know, change some long standing habits about, you know, what they've been doing here. Well, I hope that is so, because I've had to go out into the street and talk to each snow plow driver and ask them to please not plow snow into my front yard because it <coughs> goes into my basement. Yeah, no, I mean, I've also all last winter had multiple discussions with the plow guys, you know, I would run over and talk to them. And, you know, I did have some discussions higher up as well. And it did seem like it started to improve toward the end of the winter. Um, you know, so I think once it's a little bit less chaotic back there, you know, and they realize that they can't just push all the snow into the wetland area, you know, I think that we'll have to It'll be, it'll be harder for them to accomplish what they've been doing anyways. So I think some of the habits will change on their own, but, but we'll keep at it. We'll keep, you know, working with the city to, to fix what's going on up there. I certainly hope so. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions from members of the public? I believe there were still two questions about uh, how the modular construction would fit in the existing driveway. And I second the question about revisiting the number of units that are proposed to be added. So, you know, my response is basically as far as the number of units, similar to last one, I, you know, we ran we ran some scenarios with um, just four units and, you know, you ended up having to go to very large top of the market units, you know, selling close to around 500,000 each. Um, it, I'm much more interested in selling something smaller to a more median income buyer. And, um, you know, once you go to the large units, you end up being required to have two parking spaces per unit. So you're at the same, you know, because as units get larger and there's more bedrooms, there's more people living in those houses, you know, larger households, you know, so, so you end up with on average the same amount of cars, you know, so we're still required to have eight cars no matter what. In fact, actually in the smaller unit scenario, we're technically half a car less, you know, although obviously we've, you know, provided a little more, you know, so I, I just, I, for me, I'm not, we're not really considering anymore a four unit scenario. We'd rather stick with the smaller three unit scenario for the addition. I'm talking about two smaller units, just keeping the scale that you have for your units, but putting in two instead of three. 
Yes, and that that just doesn't work. Like so you're not you're not obliged to undertake that financial strain. No, it just it just doesn't pencil out at all at two units because it's a very small development. So, what was the? It's, small, it's not a small development for that parcel. It's not a small development for that area. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? People that haven't spoken or have questions that have not been asked? So I think one of the questions that's been asked hasn't been answered yet, which is just about the logistics of the construction given the size of the street. So maybe the applicant could, could address that before we get any more feedback. Uh, John, do you want to talk about how the modules come in or do you want me to do that? I'm happy to, too. Whatever. Yeah, you, I mean, you got them into South Street. <laughs> that was a pretty tight site. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, the, you know, a truck, a trailer truck brings the That's modules right. in and um, the drivers are pretty amazingly skilled. It's pretty impressive. The modules, you know, can be a variety of widths. The largest width is 15 foot seven inches for the company we worked with, um, but it can be much less. It can be an eight foot width and then they combine them on site. So, you know, we'll work within the constraints that we have essentially. I'll, I'll add to that, that, um, that the, the truck does not need to drive the module down the road and turn the corner. They can just stop at the end of the road with the module and the crane can pick it up from there and the crane will just lift it in and put it into the spot where it's going to be set. If, if it needs to be, they just get a bigger crane and move it. And how long is that process expected, that part of the process expected to last? They usually set the units in a day. Yeah, that's a one day process in this case because there's just three boxes. Okay. So when does that does that require approval by the neighbor to, to use their driveway? I don't think we'll need to use their driveway. We'll just plan the module sizes and stage accordingly so that we can stay on our property and city property. It's not mandated that you do modular either. I mean, we, that's what we would like to do. Uh, but they could be panelized and, and site built instead of modular. Yeah, it's true. We've talked to a couple builders that have kind of a what they're calling modular, but like it's more, yeah, more uh, component, you know, like components come in, you know, um, and then are assembled on site, which is like quasi modular. Can I just ask, sorry, one last question. Um, um, did, have all the um, members of the planning board actually been to the site? To be Yes. I suspect all of us. Thank you. I have not been to the site, but I'm also going to abstain from voting because I was not present at the first hearing. So I'm allowed to comment, but I will not be voting at the end of this. And I have also not been to the site. OK. Um, there not being any There's other a question members from Christine. Public, yeah. uh, there is. Okay. Yes, my name is Christine Nolan. I live at 30 Hamden Street. Um, I'm not sure if the, the engineer and the developer were finished with their presentation. It seemed like it morphed from that into just people asking questions. So at the risk of not being able to say anything, I'm going to say it's just something very brief. Uh, I have sent two lengthy letters. I spoke um, at the last meeting. And uh, you hear tonight already just a lot of talk about the very tight and awkward corner of Hamden Street, which is being proposed to add up to six more cars on a daily basis using it. And I believe the project that will add up to six more cars living in and using this property daily amounts to overuse of this awkward property and will create hardship for the immediate neighbors 
and will cause concern because of the increased traffic to the neighborhood in general, which in the past few years has seen a number of young families with small children move in. I still believe, and we'll just say once more, that this project is overfill and not infill. And I remain opposed to it. That's it. Thank you. By the way, just you, you noted in your own comments why their um, presentation was probably shorter than most because we've already done it once. So they just were not repeating themselves. I know, but because there was such a lengthy list of concerns from the DPW and some strong comments from the zoning board, I thought there would be a little more discussion from the developer and um, her engineer. And anyway, so that just surprises me a little bit, but I hope so hopefully now we'll hear you people discussing it. I agree with okay. you. Okay, do we have a motion to... I'm sorry. I agree with you, Chris. Sir? I am oh. Ian Stewart. I live at 2 Reed Street, and I'm agreeing with my neighbor, Chris. OK. Uh, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Who was so that? Second. All second. I'm sorry, who? That was Marissa and Krista, oh. is that right? Okay. Yes. Krista here? Yes, yes. All right. I'm here, I just can't have my video on or I get kicked off. I saw a lot of waving hands. I don't know if people have other comments that haven't been raised previously, but if they're not repeating questions. Yeah, sorry, Ruth, uh, one more time. Um, addressing sorry, this oh. Sorry, can I ask one more question about well, wait, there's the a possibility? Motion. Oh. Is um, David, I'm sorry, were you speaking to the motion to close the hearing, public <laughs> I'm hearing? I'm not sure, I'm sorry, no. I, I think I'm having Zoom uh, confusion. Um, you can um, withdraw the motion um, or table it um, to allow. I would table it to allow uh, Ruth's question. All it was right. my motion. I would I would table it. Uh, do we have another question or comment from someone? I guess a, it's a question slash uh, request. Is um, given that we have toddlers and um, hard of hearing people like within two doors of this um, site. Would it be possible to get a, some speed bumps maybe put into the road to slow down all the construction vehicles and everything that's going to happen there? I think that's beyond the purview of the hearing tonight. The planning board can't tell the DPW to put speed bumps in. I mean, I can just clarify that um, uh, speed bumps are installed in places where there is data supporting the fact that there are you know more than um, 50 or 85 percent of the vehicles are going above the speed limit so um, that would that takes a whole separate process um, and um, so as um, the chair mentioned the board can't dictate that that happen um, there really has to be supporting data for that okay thank you how do I get my face on there? So back to the motion that was made. Um, I don't know procedurally what we do with the motion that was tabled. Does it get untabled? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, you can just sure. remake the motion. So I move that we close uh, public comment. Is there a second? All right, motion made by Marissa and seconded by, by Krista. Second. David? Yeah, could you hear me? I second the motion to close okay. public hearing. Um, um, sorry, my internet's really bad tonight. Now let's make so, pizza seating. Um, 
we can move to a roll call vote, vote on closing the hearing, uh, the public hearing. Um, let's see, do we, how do I get everyone here? Um, so, uh, Melissa? Yes. Uh, Marissa? Yes. David? Yes. Uh, and does that, and that's it, and I vote in favor. So the motion passes um, on to discussion by the board. Does anyone have any of the board members um, have an opinion about it? Um, I can also, we can um, discuss potential conditions based on all the issues that um, were raised bo at both hearings um, and comments that came in um, from DPW, if you'd like me to go over those. Sure. Okay. Um, so, um, typically, I mean, typical conditions that you would um, incorporate into any decision would be um, that prior to any site work that um, revised plans incorporating um, any um, measures that weren't shown or issues that weren't shown on the plans be submitted in, in revisions. Um, DPW has requested that plan sheets be separated so you have one existing conditions plan and one proposed conditions plan uh, along with grading on separate sheets so for clarity's sake. Um, I think there are um, for any tree protection that will be installed based on the revised plans, and if there was one tree that is now coming down by the garage that initially was proposed um, be saved, um, that um, tree protection be installed um, and inspected before um, um, before any site work, and that a stormwater operations and maintenance agreement um, recorded. Um, at the registry of deeds for the system that's being um, incorporated on site. Um, and then um, also the, um, the issues around the electric utility pole that were raised last time, I think go away because now there's not gonna be a new pole installed on the site. Um, so I think the remaining issues related to uh, mitigating for the new trips generated by this uh, project would be for the new three, the three new units in accordance with the zoning and as offered by the applicant that prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy that that um, um, $3,000 payment in lieu of traffic mitigation be made. Um, and that prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy that compliance with the tree replacement requirements in uh, chapter 350 12.3 be uh, made either by showing the trees that have been planted on site along a combination with um, a payment into the tree fund for any um, difference in that uh, there was a discussion at the last hearing about making sure there weren't any dumpsters on site so i would recommend that as a condition um, and um, uh, based on recommendation from the DPW, um, a condition that indicates that um, no temporary or permanent barriers be installed that would block access to the city's stormwater main or sewer main. Just to be clear about the dumpster, so you mean after construction is complete? Right, not a construction dumpster. This is sort of the ongoing um, refuse uh, maintenance. Okay, any discussion or questions about the conditions? Well, hearing is the board. May I ask a quick question? Sorry, before you close. Um, you know, we, we added that, um, that fence, the privacy fence at the request of the neighbor, um, Claudia. Um, I would just like to request that, you know, if she changes her mind or if we come up with something 
mutually beneficial that she would like to see instead of that, you know, that we can agree to that Carolyn or somebody that we could have administrative review of a change like that, um, you know, as long as the parties are in agreement. Seems reasonable if the abutter agrees. Uh, since it was inserted or agreed to by you at her request, uh, it could be altered or amended. Would that work, Carolyn? Um, yeah, I think the best way to handle it would be just um, through, um, it doesn't necessarily require an amendment, but some of those minor administrative changes can be brought back before the board. So um, I think that because you've closed the public hearing, you obviously can't hear from the abutter if that makes, um, if that's a, something that um, is amenable to the abutter. So um, I would just suggest that um, if there are any changes that as with any other permit, that um, those changes could be brought before you at a posted meeting um, as opposed to needing a full-blown amendment. So you're saying it would have to come before the board again? I think it depends on the nature but of the request. So I think it's an easy enough thing to have the applicant come um, back and show uh, that they've negotiated with the new butter to do something different. And then um, that can just be brought in to you at a, at a meeting as an administrative change as, a, as opposed to a full blown amendment that has to be advertised um, and noticed for two weeks ahead of time. So I think that's the easiest way to handle it as opposed to just um, giving the discretion about this piece of it to staff. But I either I think it's an administ I think I would look at it as an administrative adjustment. So it's not gonna be a high hurdle to cross. Um, but I still think that it's it's something that needs to go to the board. Okay. So any further discussion by the board? Is there a sense that we can move forward to vote on it? Um, somebody like to make a motion? Some brave soul. There's a lot of conditions on it. Right. Well, Carolyn can help us on that. The only one that isn't on your list, Carolyn, is the one that was just recently brought in about the uh, change in the fence, uh, if, re if agreed to by the abutter. Well, the fence is now is on the amended plans that was sent, that, the plans that oh, were yes. sent oh, to you. Right. So okay. that's what has to be installed. And of course, if they want to modify that, they can come back and present right. something okay. that's slightly different. I, and I they would have to meet, they would have to meet the zoning as it relates to site distances. So it may very well be that the extent of the fence is not going to be um, as shown on the plans because it, it, it appears to be in conflict with the zoning. But that's something that doesn't have to come back to you because you couldn't waive that anyway. So I would move that we approve uh, the 36 Hamden um, site plan with the following uh, conditions as, so in case I state any of them incorrectly, uh, as indicated by the staff recommendation, which is to uh, include that uh, the applicant shall submit um, to the Office of Planning. Uh, and so sustainability, a statement by the arborist indicating the tree protection and recommended tree care uh, in preparation for the site development has been completed that tree protection uh, fencing is uh, chain link six feet tall i don't know do i need to read all of this i would just say the conditions as laid out in the staff recommendation yeah i mean those are the ones i just the ones that i just went over with you re regarding to the trip generation has to be mitigated as offered by the applicant no dumpsters on site and no temporary barriers or permanent barriers that block access to the city's easements for the infrastructure. Um, yeah, and I think that covers it. And the stormwater O&M has to be recorded um, at the registry. 
Right. Um, so as uh, stated by Carolyn and as laid out in the, um, the staff uh, report, uh, the conditions laid out there, I would move that we approve the plan with those conditions. Second. Second. Who was that that seconded? Sorry, what? Who was that that made the second? Sorry. Second, me. Melissa. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so we're ready to vote. Um, do a roll call, Melissa? Yes. Marissa? Yes. David? Yep. And Alan, yes. Oh, Krista, you're here. I don't see I am you. here, yes. Okay, so that's all. I, any abstentions? Well, I, I abstain. Yeah. Oh, and I abstain right. also. Right, all right, two abstentions. Well, that was Sam and. Okay. Yeah, because I, I, I just came yep. in, so. I, yep. Okay. And okay. Joanna, because what? I missed the first hearing. Right. Right. Okay. All right. Well, the um, application is accepted and approved. Thank you. We're all set. And we're only 10 minutes, no, 15 minutes behind. Um, okay. Are we ready to move forward to the next application? So I'll call the 740 um, agenda item um, application for site plan for construction of six units and shared driveway between two lots by P. Tush, T U S H LLC at 30 William Street, map ID 32C 268 and 356. Is there a presentation? Unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Caroline? Yes. yes. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Aaron Sharp. I will present uh, this project on behalf of Bitush 2 LLC. Um, and if you, if we can start, I can share my screen and we'll move on. I just sent you the permissions, Aaron, so you should be all set. Okay. 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 Can you see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, the, the the project that we're talking about is on 30 William Street. In William Street, you can see the the, the photo uh, from aerial photo. William Street is right here on the left, um, and this is the parcel. It's comprised of about one point. Uh, one, one and a quarter of acre, uh, which are comprised of two parcels, parcel one and parcel two. Parcel one has house, a barn, and a, and a studio on it, and the associated parking uh, and driveway. And parcel two is the undeveloped uh, land at the moment, with overgrown and uh, you can see that it's located right adjacent to the, the dikes, the city dike or the, the flood control. <coughs> we have our immediate abutter. I'm kind of uh, show who's the immediate abutter because hopefully they are all, all here. Um, so we have essentially uh, four abutters that are immediate. We have the city that abuts us on this side, and we are our own abutter also, right? the immediate abutters that 
obviously. And so hopefully they all here. I try to uh, to contact them. Unfortunately, with COVID, it's very hard to uh, to meet the abutter and contact them. I used to. This is uh, I've done many project in in the valley and in the city. I, I actually presented in front of the, not this board, but the planning board, Northampton, many, many times, and many projects in the city. And uh, I can say that with COVID, usually I tend to uh, approach my abutters, but with COVID it's very difficult uh, to even knock on somebody's door or find their phone number. So I wasn't able to, um, to speak to any of them, uh, and this is uh, usually uh, not not the way I like to do it, but that that's what happens. So hopefully they're here and we can address any of their comments or or uh, concern. So um, with that, let's let's keep move move on. And this is the project. Um, the project we call it Skinner View townhouse because we have a beautiful view of Skinner Mountain. Um, this is kind of the outskirt of the town. Uh, just to show where, where we're located. Uh, this is the site, this is the dike. Um, we're, we're very close to downtown. Uh, we're talking minutes of walking distance. You can walk on William Street through Hancock and Holly and get into Bridge Street right to downtown in maybe five minutes or even walk on the other side to the left through Holyoke Street into Ple Pleasant. Pleasant. Um, there's also a nice uh, recreational walk on the dike for, for neighbors and abutters, but with that, there are also some, some issue with that that we, we actually experienced in the past. The fact that it's right on the outskirts of the, um, the city, uh, this property, which currently is very, uh, it's, it's, it's abandoned, it's kind of abandoned, I mean, overgrown of bushes, and, uh, and, and it invites some unwanted people, an intruder, and we have people that we find living in the barn we have people that we find that uh, just settle somewhere in the in the woods and obviously by putting a development i think that will uh, um, help with the safetyness of the neighborhood um, you can see that how traffic unwanted people can bring traffic right through the out outskirts the police are aware of those issue and, and um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just gonna show the site itself. You can see it's overgrown with some, uh, with some invasive species. Um, right here where I circle this red, red circle, I found somebody that living in the wood, um, some intruder. Um, you can see it's very easy for people to come and hide it. And it's just for many, many years, I bought it last year, but it was neglected and uh, unmaintained, uh, this parcel. This is the barn and also through the barn when I bought it, um, I we do the walkthrough and we find that somebody living in the barn. <laughs> so uh, just, right here it's very easy to access so anyway this is just a little bit of the property and, and the issue this is the existing conditions plan um basically it shows what what it is now a it, it kind of show the topography how everything drained to the east this is north um we have a landing area right here and we have another landing here area in between there is a steeper slope it's not that steep but steeper slope uh, in between but everything kind of shade to to the east 
Um, the next plan is the demolition plan. Everything is in yellow. We're planning to uh, remove. Uh, we also plan to protect some trees that, uh, uh, between us and the neighbors. So we'll put some tree protection. The trees that are going to remove, you can see, are in yellow, the driveway, etc. cetera. Uh, this is our plan. This is what we're planning to do. This is our layout plan. Uh, there is all the dimension on this plan. I'm not going to get into it in detail. I assume that uh, everybody on the board had the chance to see it and review it. Um, this is a zoning summary. Um, also, I'm not going to go into detail. It just shows that we are meeting all the zoning requirements. What require, what propose, including open space, etc. All that was reviewed, scrutinized, and and we meeting all of that. Uh, the next plan is building and utility plan. Uh, this is basically shows how we planning to uh, grade the site, post grading, and also how we be planning to bring the utilities, including the drainage. Um, Again, this is a less than an acre. So drainage, although we, we did all the calculation needed for drainage, we uh, was reviewed by the DPW and uh, um, everything, we're showing that uh, everything is comply. We also got uh, a waiver because we are less than an acre. Uh, so we are waived in terms of stormwater management where we don't need to comply with that, but we uh, did not take any thought on that. We, we fully comply with all the drainage uh, um, standards. Um, this plan also show how we grade the site and what we, we pay a lot of attention how to uh, a balance the cut and feel here. It was important for me to not pull any dirt away or not bring any dirt and use all the dirt that we have on site and just grade it in a way that it's all balanced out uh, evenly. Uh, they will obviously, excuse me, that will obviously reduce uh, the amount of tracking in and out of the site. Um, usually hauling dirt is, is a big concern. Uh, the, next, the next uh, slide talk about the traffic. Um, traffic, as you can see, for six unit, um, there is a very simple formula by the ITE um, that generates hours during peak hours generate six trips, um, and in those tri six trips, you can see that in the AM peak and the uh, PM peak, you have uh, usually the the AM the PM peak is is you have more four cars that coming in and two cars that coming out, and this is how it's uh, divided. Um, I, I just gonna say, um, if I go back, sorry, to that sheet that the, essentially based on, it's only six unit, but it's very insignificant traffic generation for, for, uh, for this development. Uh, the next uh, slide show how we plan to phase the project uh, and what we showing is that we divided it into two phases. The, the front area we would like to do first, it's basically a single house and I can go to, if I don't, if I didn't go through the process, I can go to the building department and get a permit and put a one single house in the frontage. I have a frontage that meets that and uh, all the zoning requirement to put one single unit in the front. Um, 
So I would like to ask the board, you know, if, if I have the opportunity to, to actually go tomorrow to put a single house, I would do it. Um, and then the second phase is to build the rest. Uh, I, I think by doing it, it will create um, a list of distress um, or people live in, in, in the house that I have here. I have tenants and people live there and I would like uh, to finish this area of the front in front of William as soon as possible and quickly as possible so it will be less stressful on the people that live there, make all the uh, landscape look nice and the driveway and everything will look, and the, the rest of the project will be in the back with some gate and uh, usually when, when you phase it in construction, during construction people come in the morning, leave in the evening, but it, or not in the, in the afternoon, uh, but it's not, people can go to their regular routine in terms of the people that live in, in this area. So that's what I uh, would Excuse like. me, uh, excuse me, Carolyn, would it be appropriate for you to comment on the ability to get a building permit just for the front unit? Sure. Um, certainly a single family house um, is allowed um, without any further review by the planning board. However, a shared driveway triggers a site plan review. So in order to create um, a shared driveway for both parcels, that is what would require a planning board. So anyone coming for a um, building, uh, for a permit would, um, for a new house, would have to show how they're accessing the property. So if there were two separate driveways, you know, that could definitely be approved by right, but um, site plan is triggered for the shared driveway as well. So what the is, permit in front the, of you, the permit in front of you is a site plan review, um, uh, site plan review for adding um, multiple structures to one parcel and more than 2,000 square feet of construction, but also for the shared driveway. And it's combined as one site plan review. What, what is the city or DPW or I guess your, your sense of on shared driveways? I mean, is, are we, is it something that we're promoting or do we not care? Oh yeah, I mean, shared driveways certainly are um, encouraged um, because the fewer access points to a street, um, the less conflict there are for vehicles and all users of the network, not just vehicles, but pedestrians and bicyclists who are using the street. So it's, it's much safer to have um, one point of access, particularly with lots that are, um, you know, in town where you have smaller frontages, smaller lots. Um, and it's definitely preferred to have access points combined. And is, and is this, I mean, I guess the, the applicant can tell us, but I can't tell from this, how can two cars pass each other on this road? Um, so it's not a road. Um, well, I'm call, whatever you call, so, want to call it. But it, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that because there's very different review process for streets. So it is yeah. um, as a shared driveway, um, the requirements um, are that um, it be 15 feet wide. So that's wide and that's not, that could be wide enough for small cars to pass. Um, but there's a requirement that you have what we call passing turnouts every um, 300 feet. The first one has to be within 10 feet of the front lot line. So the applicant is showing that here. And that's, okay. for, that's for the purpose of pulling over to the side so someone can pass. Okay. And, and, um, and so um, that, you know, part of the review for the planning board, um, as its review, you know, once the applicant's finished with the presentation, um, you can ask questions to make sure that this the uh, project, um, so you understand what the project is and how they're meeting the requirements before you open it up for public comment. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so the next slide shows the, the easement we have to provide. Obviously, we talked about the, the, the driveway. 
the driveway will be shared by by uh, all people that live in this uh, uh, property and that's why we we have to create an easement to access uh, that we also show an easement that is existing uh, i have to say there is uh i didn't mention on the utility plan but we have a drainage pipe that crossing this is a city drainage pipe 24 inch crossing our property uh, that was installed in 1914 over 100 years ago and um, there is an easement for that um, the easement doesn't specify what's the width but the city, the, the DPW requested that we provide 30 inch, 30 feet wide uh, area for them to replace in the future. So we're showing it and we're providing. The next slide shows the um, lighting, um, the photometer, photometrics, and uh, where the lighting gonna be. Um, just a little. This is how it's going to look. Um, this is if you look at the house from the street. And this is pretty much kind of a good visual of what the lighting going to do. Um, the next slide showed the, the profile of the driveway. Um, so if you can see this, the up above is, is the driveway. On the left is William Street, and on the left of the the profile is also William Start. Starting in Williams, you can see that the highest point on the um, driveway is right here, and it's all shaded or drained right toward the east side. Um, there also the uh, geometry of the driveway is shown on this profile as well. Question about that. What's the yes. length of the driveway from the street to the last house? Um, I think that it's that around chart? 300. Uh, let me see. 300? Oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. For me to see it on this screen. Uh, sorry, I may have to. I didn't mean to, I don't need an exact number. I'm just trying to get roughly. I, are those 10 foot markings? I think it's it's less it's less than three hundred feet. That's that's what I remember. I don't remember the exact number. Uh, we can look at that later. That's fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. Now. Uh, you still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. Um, those uh, next few few slides are details, and I'm not gonna talk about those details too much. If you have questions later, I'd be willing to answer any any of this. But uh, it, it was available. The next slide is uh, um, the planting landscape and planting plan. We put a lot of effort into that uh, planting plan. Um, it's important for, for us to show, to improve the aesthetic of this neighborhood uh, or the development. And uh, we also created the, in relation to stormwater, we created some uh, water in um, bioretention or uh, if you call the uh, flower and uh, rain garden in, so you can see it right, right here in this area, which would be uh, heavily planted with all kind of uh, species and trees. Um, and in general, we have 
you can see we have, uh, it's hard to see, sorry, um, but it's over 60 tree and 81 shrubs and flower beds and gardens, etc. And obviously everything will be seeded in grass. Um, next slide shows the facade of those building. Um, the one on the left is the, the house close to William Street on the street. This is a single unit. You can see how the building facade, very similar to what is existing on Williams. The one on the right is the rest of like the rest of the development and I can show it better on the other screen. In all, in all the, those facades, the garage is uh, around 16% of, of the facade. This is how it's going to look. This is the uh, development in a 3D view. Um, we, we see the house in the front, the duplex here in the back, duplex on the left, or another single one. You can see the house, the neighbors next to us. We, we kept all the buffer in between us and the neighbor. We even planted additional trees to increase the buffer. Um, we have on this side of the property, it's very heavily wood, wooded. Um, and nobody lives in this area anyway. The houses are tucked back closer to the William Street area. Um, and this is another view of how it's going to look. This is pretty much the way it's going to look. So just to uh, uh, summarize, so how we feel that the neighborhood will benefit from the project. We believe that we are improving the, the neglected land, landscape of this property. We believe that we will eradicate invasive species and poison ivy. There is tons of that all over the site. Uh, I know this is one of the complaints of uh, my next door neighbor, Linda, that she's sensitive to it. Um, I believe we are promoting safer neighborhood. Um, people that are kind of the unwanted people that settle in the backyard will less likely show up when it's all improved. The, and lastly, I'm sure we're increasing the real estate value of the adjacent home. So thank you. This is my end of presentation. You have any question? All right, thank you. Um, are there any particular questions uh, from board members before we go to members of the public? I have a couple of questions about the driveway. Um, one is if you can just uh, show again what Carolyn was talking about, where there are those sort of uh, passing turnouts, I think that's what she called them, the areas where cars can, um, if there's you know, a car coming into the driveway and a, and a car coming out where they can um, pass each other. Um, as well as just talk a little bit about the um, uh, cars, the, the flow of cars in and out of the site. We know that that's often a concern for people thinking that um, people are going to be uh, backing out unsafely, especially Williams is a very narrow street as it is. Um, so if you can talk about the, um, you know, if a car pulls in, how are they going to safely pull back out, um, ideally heading face forward rather than backing out into the road, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, Okay, so what we did, first of all, uh, in terms of the driveway, uh, you can see we have two, two different uh, shade or hatch, as you say. Um, the narrow one is, is a pedestrian walkway and the, the lighter color is, is where, um, is 
the full width of the driveway with the pedestrian. So if car uh, come through, um, obviously it will take most of the driveway. Um, 15 feet is not enough for two car to pass. But what we did is provided here, this is a little area for car to move to the side. And if another car coming into William Street, they will be here in waiting for the car to move in. Um, we don't expect huge traffic movement here. This is uh, uh, six units generate as, as I showed previously, 36 uh, tripped for the whole development. Um, so people will drive here very slowly. Narrow driveway will create very slow movement. Uh, I expect 15 uh, mile per hour is probably uh, appropriate for this driveway. Um, somebody that, since we have a lot of private driveway for each so everybody you know if somebody pull out of their driveway they will see other neighbors that come out as well so they will wait um, if emergency vehicle will come to into this development they they have a three-point turnaround right here um, we try to make the driveway the driver will be hard surface but uh, in the area for the turnaround and the, this area, we will stay green uh, with pervious material and we show it in the detail. Oh, that answer the question. Can I ask, what is that irregular shaped um, area halfway between the three point turnaround and the front pull off? Right here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What is that? This is the. This is another driveway into the existing house. So oh, we have I a driveway see. here. We just uh, improving the apron here. Yeah, I get it. I have another question about the the drive. Is has this? Have you discussed this with the fire department yet? Because I don't. You require yes. twenty feet. Or if the house is more than 50, are these sprinkler, these buildings? It's not sprinkler. We, so, we, we did discuss it with the fire department. Uh, their comment was to allow for three point turnaround. We, uh, that is what we provided and they uh, agree with that. Carolyn, I, I just, can you, is there any way you could follow up with them? Because as I read the NFPA that Massachusetts has adopted, it, it's uh, you require 20 feet access and it, the local jurisdiction cannot override that if the buildings aren't sprinklered. So I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I just, I've run into yeah. this. And... Um, so I don't know about, um, uh, the fire code is not my area of expertise, right. um, but the fire department did look at this. We often have to work with the fire department on um, sort of looking at um, the reasonableness of some of these um, requirements. Although, um, and, and we do allow 15, 15 foot shared driveways I have been in the zoning for years and I know that the fire code gets updated and all of that. Um, I, that said though, that doesn't necessarily mean that when um, the applicant goes to pull a building permit, that that's not gonna be the time at which the sprinklers come into play. I don't know. Yeah, my so, concern is, I, I would love, I mean, if the fire department feels that they can get to the last house when a fire happens, that's awesome. I would just hate, because so much is riding on the width of this driveway being the width that it's designed and all the turnarounds and everything, it really changes the whole design. I think if you have to put a 20 foot in. So if, I think for the applicant, it would be good to just get like 100% assurance. Wait, um, well, the fire but, department reviewed this and they reviewed the turnaround and they have no problem with the driveway. I've gotten that confirmation directly from the captain. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So, and, and I think if that were any different, we'd want to have sort of a more detailed conversation with the fire department about our zoning. We certainly don't want more pavement than it's required. Um, but at any rate, the captain did um, say that this is um, 
a perfectly um, suitable design. Great. Thanks. All right, anyone else? Um, I'll just say, I, I yeah. think it looks like an excellent development in my opinion. It impinches as little as possible on neighbors. Um, there's always some impact, but this given the vegetation and the layout uh, and the, the amount of trees and the dike right behind it, uh, seems like a very um, good place for it. And as the applicant said, it'll clean up some areas that seem to be attracting vandals. Um, and uh, it, I, I think it'll be a very worthwhile project. Are the walkway driveway? Uh, I, I didn't see them in that that cool drawing that you guys have. Uh, are those? It just seems like a very. I, I don't see a. I don't see a designated place for the people to walk. Your drawing. uh not in the this is in the uh, um 3d presentation we yeah. didn't show it but it's in the plan and we show detail okay. here's the detail of what it's going to look this is a pedestrian walkway we actually plan to paint it um just the way it is show in the detail for bare feet only? <laughs> what? <laughs> he, was, he was joking. He was saying that. Um, so, Alan, when you open it up for a public comment, you um, might want to just explain how the public um, comment process um, works. There, we've got quite a few participants um, in the. Um, who are part of this Zoom. Um, all right, well, uh, why don't we open it up for public comment? Uh, that doesn't require a vote, right? No. no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll do that. Um, members of the public uh, should just um, I, I give their names and address. And uh, as comments go on, please be cognizant of what's been said before you. Try not to repeat what someone before you has already said. And um, keep the comments relatively short, given that there apparently are a number of people. Uh, all right, anyone want to start? There's someone who has their hand raised. Um, it's a uh, call-in um, person, and that's the um, I just see that on my screen. I don't know if you see that, Alan. I don't. Can we, Alan, turn, the can we turn the shared screen off so we can see the gallery, the people? Yeah, I'm thinking that with this many people, I mean, even on the last call with just a few, we had people just sort of jumping in whenever. And I think with this many participants, there I, can people use the raise hand function or is there some other way that we could manage it just to have the conversation flow a little bit more orderly. I don't know what the best practice would be. Um, Alan, are you able to see the participant list and the raised hands? I do not. Um, so if you click on the participant um, icon oh. at the bottom. Oh, um, okay. And Your then name is Earth. there are a few people with their hands raised already. So I don't know if you can go down that list. Oh. Well, there's, oh, sure, we'll try. There's somebody with a phone number of 508-450-6523. Is that person with us? Let me just. Uh... Well, we can go on to the next person. Jonathan Brody, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Um, so 
uh, you know, on the whole uh, address, um, we need people to put, put uh, let us know where they what their address is. Sure. And, we're, and can we're, we please take turn off the screen share, please, so that we can see uh, who's speaking? I look terrible right now, so I'll uh, <laughs> turn my camera up. What's that? Oh, stop. <laughs> Do you want me to go ahead? Sure. Okay. Oh, oh, the, as Marissa, so we can't, are we going to be able to see the people speaking? Um, Aaron, can you turn off your screen share? Turn off? Yes. Can I ask a question? Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me, Claudia? Uh, yes, I don't know if you what want to. Is... Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, Alan, um, I don't know if you want to explain. Um, so, I, I don't. Um, uh, the chair has called on someone to make a public comment. So, as soon as that person's done, then they can run through the list for other people to make comments. Um, oh, yeah. It? Was it Jonathan Brody? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I'm at 59 William Street. Did you go go on the Chris? And um, you know, on the whole, I think it looks good. Um, but you know, I that I I would like to kind of like place a caveat with that. Like I'm not in a butter, so this the impact on me is much less than it has on Linda and other people uh, who live uh, you know adjacent to the property. Um, I think my only public comment is actually maybe a bit of a question, um, which is when a development like this goes in, is there traffic mitigation money that needs to be put aside? You know, we've been dealing with kind of increased traffic on William Street steadily, you know, over the years and decades. Um, and, you know, some of the traffic mitigation money has been spent. Some of the measures put in place have been affected effective, some of them have not been effective. There's a lot of traffic mitigation that still needs to happen in, you know, on William Street and in the neighborhood, especially as infill happens, especially as you know, development to downtown happens and cars continually get pushed uh, into our neighborhood, often as a cut through. And so, um, you know, it's definitely been kind of a, a, you know, a, a real important issue for all of us here in the neighborhood. And you know, I think the plus side of infill is like we'll get more people here, more people will be walking, more people will be on their bikes. And my concern is those, you know, I think the property looks nice for them, but they're gonna come out onto this, you know, kind of busier cut through street that has inadequate kind of traffic mitigation already. So lastly, again, is there a requirement for the owner to kind of put aside some traffic mitigation money um, to kind of help with that issue? Uh, Carolyn, can you respond to that? Yeah, it says um, uh, there is a requirement to address traffic as part of the zoning. The applicant is offered to make a payment in lieu of providing um, improvements. The zoning specifies exactly what that amount is based on the number of units. Um, so it's $6,000 because it's $1,000 per peak trip generated. And the um, zoning is very clear that for residential units, the assumption is one additional peak hour trip per per new residential unit. Okay. So, so $6,000. This mitigation. Great. Um, well, thank you, and uh, thank you. Hey, thank you, Linda Troop. Trump. Ah. Thank you, um, and uh, Carolyn, is it okay if I go ahead and share my screen? Um, let me just um, allow that. Um, Linda Trump. She's the one who's the Okay. Remember, right or wrong. Okay. So then you just need to push the share screen. Yep. Okay, you can see it all right? Yep. Great, thank you. So I just first wanted to um, thank the planning board for providing an opportunity for neighborhood residents to speak. Um, I do have some concerns about the proposed development 
that I want to raise, and I hope you'll see through my comments that most of my concerns have to do with um, the fact that the plans for the proposed development are just attempting to squeeze in a lot uh, into the available space. So I just want to be clear, I'm not opposed to having some development on this lot. I just want to make sure that there's kind of a balance between what the uh, applicant is aspiring to do and sufficiently addressing the concerns of the people who are actually living in the neighborhood already. Um, so this first image is just to give you all kind of a sense of what the streetscape looks like right now if you're walking along William Street. And that's the space in between the current structures at 30 William Street on the left and my house 38 William Street on the right. Um, I originally had uh, some questions about the front unit. Um, in particular, when I looked uh, earlier today as uh, trying to understand <laughs> which design was being used for the front unit. Um, I really appreciate the applicant's explanation that the one on the left is intended to be the front street facing unit and the uh, one on the right is intended to be at the back. Um, one of the concerns that I think comes up um, with respect to the unit on the right as well as the duplex units as pictured on the website or on the um, materials available on the city website uh, for this hearing um, is it seems like the ratio or percentage of garage to the front facade um, may not uh, be in line with what seems to be stated in uh, rule one of the Northampton Code um, that, it, it, as I understand it, only 30% of the front facade of the primary structure can consist of garage space, and that does not include the rooftop, it's only the facade. Um, so that uh, might be something to consider. Um, I also um, wanted to mention, um, oh yeah, that a According, sorry, according to rule two, um, it's my understanding that these duplex units here, with respect to these duplex units here, that front doors um, for units are supposed to face the street and that if they don't face the street, then there should be a setback of 20 feet from the property line. And so I was kind of tracing down, like following down the property line and it appears uh, that here um, there is not a sufficient setback of, of 20 feet all the way down the property line. Um, I also wanted to ask about um, the design standards indicate that uh, that the planning board can waive by site plan approval elements of two, three, or four, if it can be shown that a different design meets a pedestrian scale design that encourages public private transition and interface. And I guess I was wondering if um, the board is thinking about waiving this requirement for a 20 foot setback, uh, what that different design element would be to encourage public private transition and interface. Um, and I wasn't sure kind of related to Samuel Taylor's question, you know, how you were thinking about that in terms of sidewalks or a courtyard just wasn't clear to me based on the materials that were available on the website. I also have some questions about the shared driveway. Um, in particular, I was wondering what the width was of the shared driveway. I couldn't find the calculation, but I was guessing it was 15 feet given the, the rules and guidelines uh, for the city. And one question that I had was whether the specified width of the shared driveway included the bike path or not, because I couldn't see that either. And I think it would be important, especially if the bike path is also going to be a pedestrian walkway to make sure that that is not part of the 15 feet and to make sure that um, there would still be sufficient space uh, for the 15 feet driveway, as well as a pedestrian walkway and bike path um, in addition to whatever setbacks might be necessary. Um, and then I also had a question related to what it says under um, 8.8R of the 
parking and loading space standards. Um, the text reads that shared driveways for residential access require site plan approval um, from the planning board and shall provide only vehicular access to the lots being serviced by it, which I think makes sense given the layout. And then it says, and shall so and shall be so stated in the lot deeds. And based on the documentation that I saw posted on the city's website, it wasn't clear to me who would be responsible for maintenance of the shared driveway and what type of language needs to be included in the lot deeds to make this clear. And I was, I was thinking about this because right now the applicant owns both of the lots, lot one uh, to the north as well as lot two where this development would go. You know, but it's possible that at some point down the line, um, you know, he might choose to sell to someone and then there might be two different lot owners. And I wonder just what it would mean in terms of the shared responsibility for the like maintenance, snow removal, easements or other issues that might be related to having that shared driveway, just in case there are different owners at some point in the future. Um, I also have a question about uh, the shared driveway as it relates to my own property line. Um, so right here where the arrow is stated, uh, that part of the driveway comes, you know, pretty close to the, the lot, the, the property line for my lot. And I was wondering about, um, you know, when it comes to like snow plowing or removal, how that would be handled, because I just wouldn't want a lot of snow to build up in that little corner uh, of my lot. Uh, just a couple of other things that I wish to highlight coming back more to like issues of streetscape. Um, in the current plan, I see that the applicant has uh, plans to remove some of the trees and he very clearly stated that he intends to plant a lot of new trees and shrubs. I was wondering if there could be more specificity about like the size or the width of the trunks of the trees that will be planted so that the, those of us in the neighborhood have a sense of how long it will take for those trees to um, grow uh, and kind of fill out green space again. Um, I was also wondering whether it might be possible to have some other large shrubs or bushes or something planted kind of near the front, uh, closer to the street to compensate for the current green space that is provided uh, for people up and down William Street. Um, a couple more points, more specifically related to the border of trees along the side of my property, property line. Um, from this aerial view, it looks like there's like a nice screen of trees. And I just wanted to point out um, that if you actually look from a street view level, there's a lot of space um, in between that's not covered or screened. Um, so I would also appreciate it if some shrubs or additional plantings, I don't know, six or eight feet tall or something could be uh, added to create more of a complete green screen between the properties. Um, and also I appreciate the applicant's <laughs> memory about my very high level of sensitivity to poison ivy because <laughs> it keeps uh, growing from that other side of the property onto my property and I'm just very allergic to it. So it would be great to make sure that that is removed as well. Um, a couple of final just general questions that I had about lots in one and two and how it relates to the neighborhood more generally. I was curious about whether these new units are intended to be rental units or owner occupied. Uh, I was just thinking about this in relation to some concerns of, about potential stability or disruption in the neighborhood. Um, I'm also curious about what the developers intentions are with respect to lot one. Um, you know, as I look at this, I can, you know, I can imagine, you know, maybe he would sell off that lot as a single family and barn to somebody else. Maybe he would develop condos in it. I, I don't know. And I guess as a, as an abutter, as a member of the neighborhood, I'm concerned that if the long-term plan is to have, you know, condos built over there, then increasing the, the number of people and cars and potential traffic across two lots, uh, it would have a greater impact. So if there's a way to have some uh, information about that, uh, it would be appreciated. So um, I just want to say that, you know, overall, I hope you can see that a lot of my concerns regard the applicant's attempt to just try to squeeze a lot into the available space. Um, 
this concern has been raised by me as well as neighbors, people knowing, people in the neighborhood knowing that I'm in a butter um, have sent me a bunch of emails and these are just some quotes <laughs> that I've received about uh, the space from neighbors. Uh, please let me reiterate that I am not opposed to having any development in this slot. I just want to make sure that the applicant's interests are somehow balanced with the interests and needs of neighborhood residents, um, you know, since it affects those of us who are actually living here in the neighborhood. And I hope that the planning board will recognize the value of achieving such a balance, especially given that the city's own director of planning, Wayne Feiden, has suggested as much in a recent interview with Mass Audubon how important it is to include community input to both you know protect open space and involve people in the process so thank you for your attention and your consideration of the points i've raised all right um let's see given the number of people that apparently would like to speak might be appropriate for people as we go along to try to keep their comments to a shorter period of time um but um Maybe the applicant could, there are many, many, many questions raised that perhaps you could just respond to the question about what you have in mind, if anything, for the lot one, the existing house. Uh, yes, lot one is currently, um, is rented. I have people, uh, we, we actually renovated the house and we put it, uh, uh, we, we rented to people we have uh, also the same people that using uh, the house using the studio space some of the people they for uh, some musicians so I'm planning to keep it for now I uh, long-term plan I probably will uh, do something else but I, we do not we do not have an, any plan yet uh, for that, we'll, for for the meantime, we'll keep it uh, rented. Um, we probably gonna do something with the the barn. We we actually, when we apply for that uh, A and R, uh, we thought to remove the barn because it's uh, it just space that is not usable. Uh, it, it's used, uh, it, it can be used, but right now nobody is using it, uh, so. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see, the next person is identified as DC, I believe. Hi, my name is Deborah Christakos. I live at 36 Pomeroy Terrace. And uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sharp, for providing all the materials. I was able to look through them thoroughly. And I, uh, I have a question and a couple of points I'd like to raise. Um, what is the distance, if you know it, or the setback from the base of the levee or the dike to uh, those, uh, the double unit house or structure um, closest to the levee and then also the single unit structure close to the levee? I couldn't find that measurement on the materials. Um, the, between the levee and and the property line, there is 15 feet. The the so, bottom of the levee is uh, to the property line is 15 feet. Okay, and then there's another. Uh, that's the area that the city owns, and uh, between the property line and and the building, there is a 20 foot setback in the back. So. So that's a full 30 feet. Sounds like. It, yeah. 20 or. 35. 20 and, and 15 and 35. Okay, yeah. 35. Okay, thank you. Um, the reason why I ask is um, my concern has to do with the actual nature of the levee, which is part of, as you probably know, uh, the river, Connecticut River flood control system. And um, I just, I remember just about five years ago, uh, the city who is responsible for maintaining the levee um, had hired a firm to do some restoration um, that involved um, removing plants, erosion protection, and um, slope stabilization because it is such an important um, part of the flood control system that protects the entire city and of course the nearby residences from flooding in the case of a hundred year flood. Um, and I just want to sort of suggest that maybe if it hasn't already been done that we make sure that the um, plans are in compliance with the Army Corps of Engineers 
um, maintenance plan for that. It is the city's responsibility to maintain the dike. And if any part of the construction or structures built sort of impede the integrity or affect the integrity of the dike, I think um, that would be big trouble. So that's one of my concerns. Um, the second is um, has to do with the traffic flow. Um, I was going to request a traffic study, but I actually know now that there is, in fact, a traffic study going on on the William Street Pomeroy Terrace um, uh, route because there's been such a tremendous increase in traffic over the past two years. In the past two years, there's been two um, additional basically residences built, multi-unit residences. There's the 55 unit uh, lumber yard, which is completely occupied. And then you have the one at the corner of Bridge Street and Pomeroy, which is another 12 units that's not even fully occupied. So the increase in traffic has been tremendous. So even though your structures alone wouldn't cause a tremendous increase, certainly we have to take them into consideration with the current increase. So I would um, ask that the results of this ongoing traffic study be considered um, when adding to the infill of the uh, William Street neighborhood. And then my third concern is that um, I've lived here for 16 years and consistently at the intersection of Eastern Avenue and William Street, there is drainage issues um, when there are heavy rains. There's a lot of pooling, there's significant damage to the pavement. Um, and in those 16 years, I don't believe that that has been remedied. Um, the Department of Public Works completed a study several years ago of the William Street Brook, and I quote from the Daily Hampshire Gazette, water in the area drains into an undersized pipe on William Street. So that's, that's a problem. And I know that Mr. Sharpie done extensive studies and modeling with the drainage, um, but I will say that I don't, I don't think your structures are gonna improve that drainage. So I think um, I would suggest that, that this is a great opportunity um, while you're digging up that area to perhaps um, at least have the developer contribute and the city remedy that drainage. Um, otherwise the damage to the exi existing infrastructure and road rate way are gonna become a chronic financial, excuse me, burden to the city. I mean, it really needs to be fixed. And if you're digging up in that area, I think now is the time to, as you said, replace the 1914 uh, stormwater drainage system. Thank you. Mr. Scharf, would you like to respond to the question about drainage? Absolutely. Uh, uh, first of all, the drainage uh, was uh, reviewed by, by uh, the DPW. Uh, we had in, in, probably, I have uh, 90 correspondence with uh, the city, with all department with the city, including, and mainly, mostly in the drainage issue. Um, the drainage, as I said, since it's less than an acre and the impact of less than an acre, usually you don't need to comply with drainage uh, analysis. We did do a drainage analysis. Our uh, site currently drained into the pipe, into the 24 inch pipe. The city asked us not to send any water, although we are currently draining into this pipe not to send any additional water to the spike. So what we did, we eliminate. So we have a catch basin in our site. We eliminate the sketch basin. Water in water that they, they generate by this development will not enter this 24 inch pipe. Uh, we, we mitigate the drainage um, on site through bioretention, and uh, uh, we show in the calculation that uh, we're not definitely increasing anything into the pipe. The pipe, it's there. Even if we replace, let's say, 100 feet, and they did ask us, uh, the DPW asked us, maybe you willing to contribute to replace 100 feet. 100 feet of pipe. This pipe go through 14 different properties, private properties. So, and it's done, as I said, more than 100 years. The section that we re will replace under our uh, property will not obviously improve the drainage issue that there is in this pipe. So this is my answer to that. 
All right, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, Amelie Hasty. Hi, thanks. That's Amelie Hasty, and um, I'm at 90 <coughs> Harris. Um, so, uh, so thank you um, uh, for allowing us the opportunity to, to speak to the board here. Um, I, uh, I guess I want to say that this is really a radical change to the neighborhood, and I can understand why a developer would want to, um, uh, you know, uh, represent this as a service to the neighborhood and as a, as a useful aesthetic change. Um, that is not how I see it. Um, and first of all, I also want to say that I think that, that you have misrepresented um, the wooded area to the other side of the levee, which is in fact nicely kept um, by the Kutchen School with trails and so on. I walk on the levee every single day. Um, this is going to be, you know, certainly a, a personally, um, it's going to be an, an upsetting change um, with the construction going on, I'm sure, if for months, possibly years. Um, and then it's also going to change very much the aesthetic of this area. Um, and, uh, and I am not interested in, uh, in uh, kind of small mansions cropping up um, alongside of the levee. I do not see that as an improvement um, to, uh, frankly, our way of life. Um, here in this part of Northampton. Um, I would also like to say that I think that um, I'm a little bit offended actually by the suggestion that there are intruders, um, you know, uh, uh, running about this neighborhood and that this, uh, this new development would somehow eliminate these intruders. Um, uh, I've lived here for almost 10 years. I've had no complaints. Um, and in fact, uh, and those who are unhoused, um, who sometimes, you know, need to camp out in the in neighborhood are not ever disruptive to uh, those of us who live around here. So again, this is not actually doing a service um, to the neighborhood. So I, I just want to make those points that I feel that these are some misrepresentations of life in this neighborhood and of um, an improved aesthetic change. This is not an improved aesthetic change. No one bought into this area or has lived here for multiple decades um, uh, and wants a new development um, around us, surrounding us. Um, and finally, I just wanna make one last point, which I think is an extraordinarily important point, which yes, I can understand, Mr. Scharf, that it would seem important to you to raise the property values. I do not actually see that as a benefit. I don't see it as a benefit to our neighborhood. I don't see it as a benefit to Northampton. That what is happening in this city, and certainly what, is, what would happen in this neighborhood, is that what is happening in this country, which is a constant squeezing out of any kind of middle class or lower middle class. And so it's going to make it much harder for young families to buy into the neighborhood, for single people to buy into the neighborhood, um, because they will be priced out of it. And I would hope that the, the city would consider such developments in these terms, that if someone wants to make a luxury development, which is what I think that this is, um, that they would be required, in fact, to balance that luxury development with affordable housing. Um, and I don't mean necessarily low income housing, but I mean affordable housing for working people who live in Northampton and cannot, cannot afford a luxury condominium. Thank you very much for the time. Okay, thank you, uh, Claudia Lefko. Hi, hi, hi. Um, thanks for having us on. I want to just sort of echo everything the previous woman just said. We live at 40 Valley Street. It's, uh, it's right over the dike from where this development is. We've been on this piece of property for 40 years. So I know this neighborhood. I walk this neighborhood. I walk that dike for 40 years. And I'm equally offended by this idea that we are a neighborhood that needs improving and, and that it is scary and that people want to break in our houses and do bad things in this neighborhood. 
We are a neighborhood that is a formerly farming community right on the edge of town. So the houses and the landscaping reflect this. And if you walk around Pomeroy and those other streets and come to Valley Street and Henry Street and all over here, you will see a different kind of aesthetic than this development is bringing. And it's not just this development, but it's the other development, the one on the corner of Pomeroy and Bridge Street with the landscaping, the grass and those plants they put in there, the shrubberies and the trees and so forth. It's not what I consider an improvement. So whereas you may, Mr. Sheriff, see it as an improvement, I, I see it not as an improvement. Um, the traffic is a serious issue. We have not only the developments on Bridge and Pomeroy, we have this development, we have the, the lumber yard, and there's also going to be a development in the St. John Cantius area by the post office. All of this is bringing more and more traffic. And you can do a traffic study if their city is doing one, but there have been many traffic studies over 40 years. And what it shows is there's a lot of traffic and it's increasing and it's not easy to mitigate it. Money won't, do, won't help with the mitigation. I think we have to put a cap on development. I just don't see that this, that this city, I'm sorry, I'm very agitated about this as you can see. The city cannot keep letting people put developments in an overly crowded neighborhood, especially developments that aren't affordable for people. This neighborhood has suffered for 40, I would say we've been here 40 years. There used to be affordable houses in this neighborhood, but what happens is people come in, they bought them not to live in them, but they flip them. So they do some sort of superficial improvement and then they put it on the market for a higher price. And over time, of course, the houses have become less and less affordable. Putting something like this in our neighborhood is going to do the same thing. It's going, if it increases property values, we don't want that. We're in this crisis. We're in a climate crisis. We're in a housing crisis. We're in an economic crisis. We're in a medical crisis. And it's time to rethink these things. It's time to think, what do we actually need in this neighborhood? We don't have the infrastructure to support more cars. We need new roads. We need new sidewalks. We need wider streets. We need a new sewer system maybe in the neighborhood. This is totally not the time for this. And so my point, I haven't looked at all the plans, although I've been paying attention and I've followed them a little bit. My complaint is that the planning board years ago, or the city, when you agreed to this new zoning proposal to allow all this development in these large lots opened up the city to this incredible speculation. So that now everybody who has a large lot has a lot that's worth quote unquote more because houses can be built on it. And so speculators are going to come in, they're gonna buy up the property and they're gonna fill it up. So on some level, I would be the happiest if we would revisit the whole zoning, especially in this neighborhood. We asked for an exemption from the current zoning and we were denied this. But it's just, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming us, you know. Across the dike, people probably know, there is a small conservation area. The goal of uh, the conservation area that's on across from our house on Valley Street is to maintain, you know, open space, but with indigenous plants. We're trying to get rid of plants that don't belong in our neighborhood. So if you're telling us that on the dike and behind the dike, I'm going to walk there and see some beautiful planting and a pond and some trees, that doesn't appeal to me. What appeals to me is nature. That's why we're here. So what appeals to me is the idea that you might, you know, take on the idea that we're using in the conservation area. The, it doesn't look a mess to me personally there behind the barn, whatever. It's your, your, what is good for you is, is not a mess for me. And I want to finally say that the house maybe in barn you feel was abandoned, but 
when the by family sold that farm property some years ago and it was bought up by i don't know the people's name but it was a pleasure to watch the way they cleared that land the way they renovated that barn and you would i would walk by and every day i would find a great pleasure in the investment these people were putting in the property so i don't know how long they've been gone but if it's a mess now it's 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 the owner's responsibility you know to clean it up so i won't go on farther further, but except I want to really plead to the planning board, not to even if this meets all the requirements, although I don't think it does in terms of the way it fits in the neighborhood. That was a big issue when the new zoning was passed. The people wanted in structures that would have a fit in easily to the neighborhood, and this doesn't aesthetically do that. So I would press on you to not allow this a lot allow this and to actually put a moratorium on this this kind of development in this particular neighborhood thanks i'll stop okay thank you claudio <laughs> zoe tuck hi yes can you hear me yep okay uh yes uh, my name is zoe tuck i live at 11 butler place um, and I just wanted to um, register my opposition to this development as planned. Um, I appreciate what some of the previous commenters have said. Um, I think my primary concern is the character of the development as a like luxury housing and condos. Um, and I think that that would take an already uh, pretty prohibitively expensive neighborhood in a relatively expensive uh, city in the area um, and, and contribute to it becoming more expensive. Um, you know, it's, it's already a bit of luck for me personally to be able to live in this neighborhood. Um, and I, I could definitely see myself and others like me being priced out. Um, you know, I, other commenters have <clears throat> mentioned that uh, the raising of property values is not um, a unilaterally uh, good thing <laughs> for everyone. Um, it, it affects lower and middle income folks. Um, and I, I do think, uh, especially I, as someone mentioned, um, you know, the fact that we are in a pandemic um, that is linked to a housing crisis. Um, and I just believe this is not the kind of housing we need. We need affordable housing. Um, and low income housing. We don't need luxury housing. Um, and I also wanted to mention that I'm, as with most of the other residents of this neighborhood, I'm a frequent user of the trail on the levee. Um, I think that this will impact, um, you know, people who are using that trail. Um, and I, I am also, I do share the concerns of one of the other previous commenters. Uh, about the owner's intentions toward the residents of lot one. Um, you know, I, I moved to Northampton from the Bay Area in California. I moved there from Austin, Texas, so I'm very well aware of uh, how gentrification works. And it works through, you know, you bring in the condo development, you evict the old <laughs> residents, uh, the longstanding residents of the neighborhood, um, and then you turn that a uh, uh, lot into condos as well. So I think that this, this doesn't bode well um, for, the, for the residents of lot one, and this doesn't bode well for other uh, people in the neighborhood. Um, and then finally, I don't wanna take up too much time, but I just wanted to mention, and I, again, I'm not the first person to mention this, um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Scharf's uh, dehumanizing remarks about the unhoused people in the neighborhood who I, I will also register as a resident of the neighborhood, um, have no negative impact. Um, I was jotting down some of the language used, uh, some intruder living in the wood, um, somebody living in the barn, uh, unwanted people, vandals. Um, I, don't, I, I really don't think this accurately represents uh, the people being referred to. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's see, somebody with a phone number is 508-450-6523. Um, um,
Anyone want that phone number? Okay, moving on, Lynn Davis. Hi, my name is Charlene Gentes, 25 Hancock Street. I live on the corner of Hancock and Williams Street. Oh, I'm sorry, is your phone number the one that I read off? No, I'm Lynn Davis. I'm on that computer. Oh, it's my Davis. partner. Okay, fine. Yeah, hi. Um, so first, just I, I would like an answer to the first woman who spoke, um, asked quite, quite a few questions, and one of them was, um, is this going to be renters or is this an owner occupied? If, if we could have an answer to that, please. Oh, yeah. I could just interject briefly that you have to be, I mean, the applicant can answer the question, but the planning board can't distinguish between condominiums and rental property. Well, but I think we can only approve units of housing, however, they might be owned. Okay. But I, I, he did answer, I believe if, did you say owner occupied? No, I, I didn't say that. I, I no, just not said, you. I'm sorry, Mr. Sharp. Okay, sure. The owner. Yes, I did say that. The, owner yeah, I heard you say that they're going to be owner. Okay, thank you. I, you know, I appreciate that. Um, my, I, I, two concerns that I have that other people have already spoken about. One is the affordable housing uh, concern. I, I have no idea how. Uh, the, the price of these units, what they will be luxury, uh, you know, tends to be hundreds of thousands of dollars in my experience. So that is certainly a concern of mine um, as we are facing more and more need for affordable housing in this sweet little town of ours. Um, as well, it's hard to let go of, of land. Uh, but my main concern is around the traffic. I mean, the traffic in this neighborhood is horrific. I mean, between the trucks and the people zooming down Pomeroy, every time I cross uh, William Street to go for a little walk, I feel like I take my life in hands. I mean, the traffic down Pomeroy cutting through Williams there's just so much of it. And now we're talking about 36 more trips in and out of William Street. Um, it's just of great concern to me. Um, and it already feels like it's such a full street of housing um, already. Um, it just feels like too many. Six is a lot, you know. Um, it just feels too many to me. And, and also the housing structure and the engineering of it, I'm not so sure matches the rest of the uh, street um, and the housing on the street, but traffic is of, of great concern to me. Uh, so thank you for the time. All right, thank you, Carla Ness. You're on mute. Carla, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Carla Ness. I am the broker at Black Real Estate. Uh, I do not live in Northampton. I live in Cummington. Therefore, I'm sitting in my car. Uh, but uh, DeLap representative for uh, the sale of these condos. Uh, we think that it is a nice development. Uh, it is kind of fulfilling some of the city's desires to do infill close to the desired area of, North, uh, of downtown Northampton that where people will be able to easily walk to town and probably be able to walk other places. Uh, who will, may move there will also enjoy the dike. I know that is a very integral part of that neighborhood. It is something that I have also walked on. And it is, uh, I think he's, uh, Aaron has done a nice job in the landscape. Well, I think uh, zooming from one's car is perhaps not the best way of doing it. 
Um, I think we'll have to go on to the next person, Marta Rudo. Can you hear me? Yep, you're Marta Rudo. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, I live on 90 Pomeroy Terrace. I've lived here for 10 years. And I don't have a lot of new things to add, but um, there are a number of people in the neighborhood who have said things that I just really felt like I needed to second, third, and fourth, which is that this is a fabulous neighborhood. It does not need improvement. We do not need people to be removed that are camping out in the trees. This is just really was such an offensive representation of what this neighborhood is. And it seems like somebody who actually has never lived here. I also know a lot about plants and I promise that this development will not be able to rid this neighborhood of the invasive species. They are all over Northampton and good luck. Um, maybe something that's worth trying, but what's really worth trying is to hold on to this sense of neighborhood, give more space for people to live who can afford to live in a town like this. Not, not, we don't need more luxury condominiums. There are luxury condominiums all over the neighborhood that are not selling. So the traffic is a problem. And I, I think I'm often confused by what the city wants for infrastructure and for housing and for places for people to live. I'm all supportive of that, but I'm confused. I'm confused by why the city so wants so many people so close together in a neighborhood that is actually quite packed with an intense traffic pattern. And I, I just, I'm confused by what the goal is for the city. But in the meantime, I know something will happen, here, but I hope we really look at what can happen and maybe there could be a compromise with less development and, and a real respect for the neighborhood that is already here, not just disregarding it as a place that needs improvement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I just want to remind everyone that we appreciate everyone's comments, but we mostly appreciate comments that haven't already been made. Uh, let's see, Katie Irwin. Hi, good evening. Thank you very much. My name is Katie Irwin, and I'm also at 90 Pomeroy Terrace. Um, I, I just want to basically say that I agree with all of the oppositional comments. I'm not going to repeat them, but I do agree with them all. Um, I do have a question. I think I may be misunderstood and I, I did want clarification. One of the things that I love about this neighborhood, one of the many things, is the historical nature of the neighborhood. And I kind of got a sense that maybe the barn was on the current property was maybe something that would be demolished. And I didn't know if that A, that I understood that correctly, and B, if that was a historical building, um, if that was something that would be allowed. So that, that's a question. But I just also wanna reiterate my feeling for this neighborhood is the historic nature of the neighborhood and what we have here. Um, and I don't believe that the current development is in line with what the neighborhood is is and i and i agree with all of the comments that were made so i don't want to repeat those but i did have that question on the barn mr sheriff could you is that a question that you can answer regarding the barn yes, yes. Uh, the barn is not part of this project at the moment and so it's it, we talked about it already. Oh, yes, I understand that, but my, I kind of- It's not part of the project currently. It's not a part of the current project. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, Anita and Will Sawyer.
Are they here? I don't think we signed up to speak, but I'll briefly say I agree with the objections. We're, we are more recent, but we really searched for a place that would be just like this neighborhood with all kinds of ages, um, something we could afford. It's peaceful and welcoming and very precious. And I worry that would be changed with this project. All right, thank you. Um, let's see. Um, Brian and Barbara. Are Brian and Barbara with us? Um, yes, uh, um, I didn't have my hand raised, but um, I've been in this neighborhood for 62 years. Um, I live in the house that my grandparents built in 1914. We're at 42 Williams Street. Um, it was built as a duplex um, because it was a, um, at that point it was a farming and uh, blue collar neighborhood and it was the affordable neighborhood in, in the city. Um, I really, I would hate to see luxury condos go there. Um, I don't need my, my house, uh, evaluation um, raised. Um, it's hard enough to to meet the, the taxes as they are. Um, I would hate to lose my family homestead as our taxes go up, as our evaluations go up. That's it. All right, thank you. Carolyn Oppenheim. Um, Alan, can I ask, I, I don't, I'm, it seems like um, we're calling on people who don't have their hands up. Um, am I miss, I'm not sure who. Well, good question. I, um, this, on this, when I press on participants, there's this list, and I'm just going down it. I'm not sure how else to do it. Yeah, but it, do you honestly, see the little hand icons? That's, that's, those are the only, and I think a right. number of the people. Well, yeah, so far, almost everyone, I think everyone I called on has a hand icon. Um, uh, I see four I, people I, that have I, hands up right now. Me too. Um, I'm sorry, but say that again. There's four people who have the hands up right now. Right, and one of them is Carla, who already spoke, uh, but had the yeah, connection so issues, and that 508 yeah. number who you've called on a couple of times. Oh, all right. Actually, Karen Op Carolyn Oppenheim does not have a hand up. Right. Um, but I'll say quickly that- Very quickly. The reason my <laughs> hand is not up is because everything I was going to say has been said so eloquently by so many people, I will not take any time. Thank you for not repeating everybody. Um, Let's see, going down, de uh, hmm, well, I don't see, I don't see any more hands. There are four hands. Um, I think no. Bill has his oh. hand up. I, Alan, I'm not trying to play your job, but there's Bill, the phone number, Carla, and somebody listed as they're not intruders. I think the phone, phone number, I thought I already did, but Bill, right, okay. How about Bill, is he here? I'm here. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds like you can. Uh, I live at 87 Henry Street, which is right where the dike makes a right turn. Um, I walk the dike very frequently, and I love what I see, which is uh, farm scenes, scenes, scenes from, the, from an older time, farm equipment. I have ducks in my yard. People have chickens in their yard. There are blueberries. There are raspberries. There are little farm plots. I love it. When I saw this rendering, especially the one overhead shot, that Mr. Sharp showed, I was appalled, frankly. It looks to me like they designed in order to maximize intake, profit, um, jammed a little mini uh, Levittown it, right up against the dike. And I have two feelings about this. Why do you want to do this to our neighborhood, number one? And, and I was wildly opposed to the zoning change. And 
we were really reassured that this kind of stuff would not happen. And we were silly enough to believe that. Um, now it feels like uh, the town is willing to sacrifice our neighborhood and the wonderful sense of community that's here in order to increase the tax base. And I really feel bad about that. I'm finished. I'm gonna take it here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Welcome. Let's see, I think, I think, am I missing anyone? I think everyone, every, that's all the hands, the, the remaining hands have and already seen. The, whoever is there, not intruders, that's the last one. is has their hand up. I don't know who that is. Does some, does they're not intruders want to speak to tell us they're not intruders? Um, I would actually like to say some other things. My name is Liz, and I live at 16 Valley Street. Um, I'm in alignment with all the opposition, which Sorry, is probably you need to, obvious. You need to say your first and last name. Liz Fitzgerald, 16 Thanks. Valley Street. Um, I'd like to hear um, Mr. Scharf speak to the questions that Linda brought up. Um, she asked a great number of questions, did a great deal of research, and I did not hear those questions answered, and I, like, I would like to hear them answered here now tonight. So to clarify the planning board process, we take public comment and then the board will have an opportunity to deliberate amongst ourselves and also go back to the applicant. And at least I have been taking notes about questions and we'll be um, reiterating some of those. Um, so we will be able to get some, some answers in the next phase of the hearing. Um, all right. So it appears to me that everyone who indicated a desire to speak has spoken. We want to give Carla a chance to finish. Uh, you have a better connection now, Carla. Did Carla not finish? Or her hand well, is still up. I don't know. I, I put my hand back up because I moved closer oh. to to the steps of uh, the community house here in Cummington because I was worried that my comments weren't heard because I was too far away from the internet source. Uh, but it does appear that people did hear what I had to say. And if that's the case, then I have no other comment. And I just wanted to apologize for bad internet connection. No, you got cut off. Um, all right. Are there any other people who have not spoken who and who I have not whose name I haven't called? Um, okay, so does, is there a desire on the board's part to close the public hearing? Or we should keep it open so we can ask questions of the applicant? Does that make sense? We probably yes, want to I keep it I'll open for a little while. Yeah. Okay, so um, board comment. Who would like to address the issue? Um, I can also provide some responses. There were some questions about, um, you know, sure. evacuating traffic and stormwater and, um, well, and, and setbacks. Info. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as it relates to the infrastructure, the the um, the dike or levee. Um, DPW did look at this to make sure there were no conflicts with the, um, with the levy. Um, that was one of their main concerns. In fact, originally the applicant had shown a walking path that would go up the side of the dike and DPW said absolutely that was not appropriate because they wanted to maintain that as a piece of, um, you know, flood, as part of the flood control system. So. Um, I think that's, that's um, been addressed. There is also a stormwater requirement, um, not a separate permit, but um, a requirement that the applicant meet the stormwater standards for the city because it is, uh, because of the scale of the project requires that. And um, so there's been an, an extensive assessment of that. There, um, the city knows that there's a problem with the William Street Brook and the drainage into that system, and that's why the applicant was not allowed to tie any water into that system. So it's not going to make it any um, 
better. Um, the applicant's not required to um, um, fix an existing problem that's off the property, but um, the applicant is taking care of their own stormwater on site. Um, so, um, the, and the DPW is satisfied with the way that that's happening. The DPW did ask for some modifications to the planting plans related to um, the area around the easement for um, the stormwater um, the stormwater line, the existing um, Williams um, Brook line, um, and there had been some trees proposed for that area, and DPW would like a condition that indicates that there will be only shrubs, <clears throat> excuse me, and perennials planted within that easement area, so as to not further complicate the drainage problems that are within that line and if they have to go in and fix and repair that it won't be a problem it won't be an issue with that so i would i mean later when you talk about potential conditions we can talk about that <coughs> excuse me um <coughs> i also wanted to there was a question about setbacks and um those you guys can talk about that but those are being met as well <coughs> All right. Uh, anyone else want to um, tell us what they think about it? I thought I would jump in and pro provide clarification on uh, one question that I think maybe Linda had about the true replacement requirements. Carolyn or other board members, please jump in if I'm misrepresenting this. But um, the uh, True replacement requirement is based on the caliper inches um, of the trees that are being taken down and there's just a, a standard formula that's used for that and usually the replacement trees that go in are fairly small and the reason is that they're shown to um, do better and, and um, have more uh, they're more likely to live than if you plant a bigger tree because it's just more stress to, to move a larger plant. And so what you're gonna see going in is, is our small plants, but that's um, to give them a better chance of survival and to not need the extra expense of replacement later. So in terms of your, your question about what to expect, um, that's what and that's why. Um, one of the questions that was raised that maybe Carolyn, you can speak toward was the, um, a question about the the zoning for the percentage of the garage as a, a in the facade um can you explain what the requirement is and whether that's being met here um sure I, oh. okay all right i i well, just thought to to uh, to show the <laughs> i have the the part of the regulation and what show it shows with the garage uh, with with it with the roof line so if i can share my screen well excuse me mr chef rather than uh, read the regulations carolyn could you clarify that yeah. off, off the top of your head sure yeah i mean we we looked at that that question came up before the hearing, um, and so we asked the applicant to make sure to show those dimensions. You saw that in the hearing. That is, um, we've reviewed this on, on many projects, um, even single family homes that have come forward. So we're comfortable with the um, presentation and the analysis that it meets the 30%. Um, and of course, you know, even if the building the plans change between what you know are tweaked between now and what the planning board um, between this hearing and when they actually submit um, for the permit we always run the numbers look at and ask the applicants to submit the ratio so that um, that gets evaluated <clears throat> thank you um yeah. Sorry, I have some more questions. Sure. Go ahead. Um, one of the questions that came up was about the um, the maintenance of the shared driveway and um, uh, it, particularly if the ownership of lot one and two is split, can you just address how that um, is, is logged to make sure that that's taken care of if ownership is split later on down the line? Uh, 
I think the, the sure. member of the public act specifically about whether that got specified in the deed about the maintenance plan. Yeah, so as the um, as the abutter noted in the zoning, it says that that's required. So um, I actually recommended to the planning board that that become part of the condition, even though it doesn't have to be. They need to show before, you know, I would suggest it happens before a building permit is pulled or at least before a certificate of occupancy for any of the units that the maintenance um, obligations are clearly identified in easements that are that go on record for both lots. So since the existing house will have its um, access coming from this sh new shared driveway, um, the easement has to um, include that lot. And um, if anything changes on that lot in the future, that's going to automatically trigger an amendment from the planning board. So it's not as though um, even if a parcel sold off later and then the subsequent owner wants to make a change that no one will ever know about it. Um, <clears throat> once this is sort of this is by its nature because of the shared driveway, it's part of the site plan, um, at least that linkage anyway. So all of that has to go on record before a certificate of occupancy is granted. Great. Yeah. So, all right, do you have more on your list? Um, I don't have more on my list. I guess I just want to speak personally and say that I too live in this neighborhood. I live on, I rent on Hancock Street. Um, and I agree with a lot of the comments about the charm of this neighborhood. Um, but I, I in my personal experience, disagree with some of the characterizations of the neighborhood as well. Um, I don't experience it as a place of heavy traffic. Um, I don't think that this is going to, you know, materially take away from uh, enjoyment of the dike. Um, and I think the fact of the matter is that in Northampton, we need more housing of all varieties. And um, uh, we know that affordable housing is difficult to build and uh, make it economical for builders. And so I don't think it's realistic to expect that, um, you know, developers are going to subsidize um, affordable housing, even though we absolutely do need to add to that stock. I also want to encourage people who are concerned about the zoning that there's another public hearing coming up to look at um, allowing two family houses by right. And so if you want another opportunity to participate in ongoing conversations about zoning hearings in the city to look that up on the city website and you know contribute your thoughts there because we're constantly trying to look at how we can um, make development happen in the city in an effective way. So um, I think everybody tonight did a really good job of um, contributing comments um, that are particularly um, uh, possible for us to act on because they're connected specifically with the zoning. So, you know, bring that um, attention and intelligence to further conversations because we do want your input. I think that's all for me for now. Yeah. I, um, I want to revisit one go ahead, the, David. Yeah, one of the first questions um, raised by one of the abutters was um, kind of a I think maybe Carolyn could help um, shed some technical um, interpretation having to do with the location of the entrances um, facing the street or not facing the street and within and, and how that 20 foot setback um, clause should be uh, understood because I think there's some confusion between the shared driveway and, and a street in this situation possibly or I don't know Carolyn if you want to sure. play in on that. Um, sure so the orientation, um, the idea is that if um, new units are built in a way where the backyards are oriented to, um, or the front facing um, portions of the units are oriented to the backyards or side yards of budding residences, that that would then um, require potentially a greater buffer. Um, so in that particular, um, for that particular structure, that really is oriented towards William Street. So it has the same, it shares a side lot um, and uh, side of the house, the same as the, as the other units on that street and the way the other units are oriented. So that would not trigger the additional 
requirement for added buffer or an evaluation by the planning board. Planning board has the ability to reduce that 20 foot additional buffer for structures that do um, orient um, towards the side. Lots of other houses um, from 20 feet to 15 feet. The applicant is actually asking for that reduction for the other units on the southerly side of the lot. So if you look at the duplex and the single unit on the, on, in that L, those units um, are oriented in a way that would trigger that additional um, buffer uh, from the lot lines. However, in the application, the applicant is asking for reduction from the 20 foot to the 15 foot. And um, on the west boundary, the one that runs parallel to William Street, um, the applicant's showing um, new planted um, evergreen screen along that as a mechanism to provide that privacy and that separation um, within a 15 foot setback instead of a 20 foot setback. And then of course you heard that the applicant was showing that there was a heavily wooded um, tree um, um, buffer essentially that exists on the abutting property to the south and thereby sort of already has an existing kind of screen to the other parcel. Okay, actually, I'd like to follow up on what Jana said um, I, <clears throat> about affordable housing. I, I agree with what you said. Uh, there's, it's unquestionable that there's an enormous need in this country and probably all over the world for affordable housing. It's, we, there's a terrible need for affordable and even um, low income housing. The problem is it's impossible for a private developer to build it. Valley CDC builds affordable housing, the, uh, the big lumberyard project. They do it because they get enormous amounts of federal and state subsidies. The cost per unit of those apartments that they build is something like $250,000 or even more per unit. I mean, no private developer could possibly do that. So all that we can do, I think, is encourage more housing of any kind and type because that will by itself drive down the price of housing. Uh, it, it's affordable housing is extremely difficult to get built. So um, going on, what do we think about the application? Anyone else? Are we ready to close the public hearing? I vote to close public comment. Can I ask one other question? I would like to ask another question of the applicant. Sure. Uh, just raising one other. Uh, At our right, Sam? Yeah, today. Today it is. <laughs> it hasn't been seconded, so. <laughs> <laughs> it snuck in under the wire. Under the um, I'm, wire. Just, I, I'm just going back through my notes of, of other questions and just wanted to uh, bring back up one thing that was raised by the um, abutter, um, just asking questions about um, uh, some the planting plan, particularly for the front of the property, including some uh, a specific request for, for potentially some additional uh, shrubs for screening on that. I guess that's the southerly edge where your property borders hers. And I'm wondering if the applicant, that's not something that uh, we would typically require, but I'm wondering if that might be something the applicant would be willing to provide as a nice gesture for that abutter. Yes, I, I, absolutely. Actually, we show it in the plan. We do have some plan if you look on in uh, the planting plan to put some trees and shrubs right in the front and we showed it in the 3d uh, uh, presentation as well well i think she also pointed out that um line of uh trees which on the the drawings look a little um well what, what she pointed out was it, it sort of on the drawings it looks like a nice a nice sort of solid buffer <coughs> I think she was suggesting that um, also that some kind of understory brush there, um, which I, I don't think that was on the plan, but maybe I missed it. If we're talking about the same place. Um, lower, lower uh, type of uh, um, Right. Yes. 
Um, I'm open to that. I think it, it's uh, the last time I saw it is very, very <laughs> well between, between between the two property. Um, um, and, but we can always add and improve the, the buffer uh, as long as uh, we can work together and wherever she wants, I, I'm willing to, to do that, of course. Um, and I, I had one more. She also brought up the issue of... Um, Excuse me, wait, Marissa, to interrupt for a second. So how can we incorporate uh, what was just discussed? Um, so, so can I just ask for clarification, what boundary are you talking about um, along the um, right you know, parallel um, to the driveway or in front along William Street? No, it's, uh, I think the, there are two, two different uh, things that were asked. One is the lower brushes under this row of the arborvitaes or tree that we have in between the two properties. Okay. The lower uh, brushes where there is a see-through. She, she showed, uh, Linda showed a picture where you can see some of my property through her. So to screen a little better with lower evergreen. Um, and also there was a question about putting some tree in the front, which we provided. And if we provide additional, we, we will. Um, Is it possible for us without quantifying that or identifying the spacing to just say improved or additional? Yeah, I think, um, I guess, I think the board needs to determine, I mean, yes, I think it would be a good gesture, but without, um, without seeing a revised plan or specify, I mean, it, I guess the question really is, does the board think that that's necessary to meet the site plan or is it just an additional accommodation for the app, for the abutter? Um, there, there's nothing that requires um, complete screening between residential properties. Um, I think the, I think the only buffer that's really required is along what would be um, Linda Trapp's rear lot line, where there's a request to reduce from 20 feet to 15 feet. So, if that's the case, and the board wants to say, okay, put. Um, intersperse shrubs between, you know, in the gaps between each planted tree, you know, evergreen shrubs along that, that make, that might make some sense because that creates that privacy screen essentially that's required by the zoning um, for that area. But if it's somewhere else, then um, without seeing the plan, I don't think it's an enforceable kind of condition to say, work with the neighbor. So are we talking about the southerly boundary, uh, right? Uh, I think that, well, if it's the rear lot line of Linda Trout's property, that's the westerly boundary of this subject parcel. Oh, all right. Yeah, I don't, I mean, the pic according to the picture that I saw, it's not the rear, it's the side where- Yeah, I think you're talking about the south property line no, yeah, between we're, the driveway and the, the new house. Was taken from her driveway mm -hmm. toward the house, the existing house. Okay. And you, yeah. I, I, I question, this is a tricky one because you have some pretty mature arborvitaes there that a lot of people spend a lot of time and money, you know, getting them to this point. Yep. Um, and I think it'll be pretty tricky to grow some other shrub just in the understory of these arborvitaes. You're going to have to to have anything live healthily there, you're gonna have to actually take down the arborvitaes, I think, you know, cause, or you're really gonna disturb these mature trees. So you, and you're gonna end up with, you know, shorter trees, so you'll see from the second floor. Uh, I think going back to the original conversation about there is a sort of by right single family home in the front of this lot, uh, you know, um, I know it's part of a bigger application, but you know, you go down many streets, you know, we don't screen every single family home from every other single family home in the city. I mean, that's just, that's not a feasible thing to do. And if we do have privacy, it should be contingent on the property owner who's desiring the proper, the privacy, not, you know, 
We don't have shutters 10 feet off of all of our windows. Yeah. Right. I, I, and to be clear, because it kind of, I asked the question and it kind of went off the rails. I don't think I would have, um, I asked in the spirit of Mr. Shuri started the whole conversation by saying I, I, I prefer to knock on doors and I prefer to speak to people. Um, and so I only asked that because the abutter brings it up and it might be a good opportunity for that kind of uh, this discussion. I don't, I would, I would not propose to make it uh, a condition, whether enforceable or not. I don't think I would propose to make it a condition. Um, but I'm, I'm never a fan of unenforceable conditions. Anyway, I don't think we should be in that business. Um, right. On the issue of this, the driveway, there was also a question that came up or a concern about snow um, clearing around that corner, the tight corner and I, you know, it, it goes for anyone that you can only push snow on your own property and you can't push snow on someone else's property, but there are trees there. Um, and in the planting plan, I think, um, and just sort of to answer that question, um, it appears that, uh, you know, there will be planting that the applicant is, is putting in around that corner. So any snow would damage those plants first before they get onto the a butter's property. So I'm, I don't know that there would be um, a concern that would need to be addressed with that. Um, and, and there was also a question about the width of the driveway um, um, and whether it includes the bike path. I wanna be clear, there's no bike path here. It's just a driveway and there's a painted pedestrian path as I think the planning board has seen the plans that is part of the driveway I mean we don't it's um this site plan review does require pedestrian access from the street to the units um but in this situation where you've got a very um very few units using a shared driveway that's um got some curves in it to um to sl slow car, I mean, cars are gonna be going very slowly around these curves. I think it makes sense to allow the, the mix of um, pedestrians, the, of walkers and, and automobiles on the shared driveway. It, it's typically what happens in shared driveways in the suburban um, parts of town as well. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that for, um, the public as well as for the board that um, there doesn't um, you have the discretion to determine that whether or not there actually needs to be a completely separate uh, pedestrian path all right there's a motion on the floor I think is there a second do we remember what Sam's motion was I think it was to close public comment and I would second sure. that Okay. Uh, There's still a couple of us with hands raised. I'm wondering if we could speak before you close public comment. Sure. Um, people that haven't yet spoken. Uh, it's Claudia and I. This is Liz from 16 Valley Street. Um, as a renter in this neighborhood, I'm really particularly concerned about how the renters at lot one are going to be protected by any um, right. I'm sorry, tracking. who's speaking? Who's this speaking is Liz now? at 16 Valley Street. Okay. So you, you have a question as to how the renters at Lot 1 will be treated? How they'll be protected given that, the, um, that Mr. Scharf is wanting to do some construction during this era of COVID-19, um, especially with the removal of the bay windows. Um, just really concerned about their safety and well-being and not hearing that being addressed here. I, I think Mr. Sharp can briefly respond to that, but it's not any part of our deliberation tonight. Do you want to briefly respond to that, Mr. Sharp? Uh, I, I, I think it's kind of a, a weird question. Uh, on behalf of my, I have very good relationship with my tenant. They know how to reach me and to ask me so i uh, and i do take care of them pretty well so it's it's weird to ask to hear a question from somebody else about 
my tenant. I, I don't know if I need to answer it. Right. Um, I can respond as well. The Board of Health has to review every construction project and make sure the protocols are being met for under this current um, pandemic situation. So they're the ones with the jurisdiction, the Department of Health is the one that has jurisdiction about how construction will proceed. And Claudia, was there something you wanted to say that hasn't been said yet? Well, I just want to say I'm listening to the wrap up of the conversation and I'm not hearing the urgency of, of the moment we're in. And so I'm urging the board to really not make a decision. I hope you won't make a decision tonight because when you throw up your hands and say, all we can do is let housing go, I feel like you're not taking your responsibility seriously. What the optimum solution is, is that people could afford to buy a house that we don't need to have Valley CDC spending all this money to provide housing. They do it because housing is unaffordable. And every time we approve something like this, you just play into this thing that the housing goes up and up and up. So please don't throw your hands up. Pause, take a real breath in this moment and try to do something different. I'm urging you, so thanks. I, I guess I have to say, I am a little unclear. The, the lumber yard was a, a, a huge project. It was very beneficial to the city. Um, that, and that was before I was on the planning board. I, I, I'm just, I'm, feel, I'm feeling like I'm hearing, and, and I do want to move on because it's very late, but I'm he, hearing a, sort of very mixed things of we need affordable housing, but then there's, you know, sort of complaints about the, the traffic from the, from the lumber yard and what that br brings into the neighborhood. And it is in fact, and I understand Mr. Sharif used the, the language of raising, um, you know, property values. And, and I hear what, what many of you are, are saying about that. But the fact of the matter is, is that increasing, generally increasing the number of the supply of housing actually has the effect of, of making housing generally more affordable. It's a supply and demand kind of thing. So but, I- happens in Northampton? Have we got more housing that's more affordable? I, it, I mean, more housing <laughs> increases supply and supply in, you know, in brings, gener makes the, whatever it is that is in the market more affordable. It so I, I just- like It's done that in Northampton, but- you know, the rent goes up and up and up. So I- But I, at I, any rate, it's not our purview, right? No, so, I mean, we- But it seems you're big players in this. I won't argue with you, but just to say, it'd be interesting to know what is the relationship. We do have this housing at the lumber yard, but in this ward, what is affordable compared to what is high-end housing would be interesting to take note of. I think mostly it's higher than people can afford. So, so I'm well, sorry, thanks. Thanks for your- No, time. no, no, it's okay. It's just it's been a long night. Yeah. All right. um, well, they're, they're all important questions, no doubt about it. Um, I move to close public there, comment. Is there a motion? Yeah, okay. Is there a second? second. Marissa, you second? Um, Still second, right. yes. <laughs> so, let's see. You know, Jana? what did you think? Oh, Jana? the more housing, the better, but the more high-end housing, the yes. It just Well, we're, we're, we're voting on a motion now. Jana? Yes, and I'm voting yes to close public comment. Melissa? M Melissa? Okay. There we go. There we go. That, yes. All right. Marissa? Yes. Krista, now that we can see you? Yes. David? Yep. Alan, yes. All right. Um, public comment is closed. So discussion on the board. I guess we've already done a lot of discussion. Um, is there anyone that feels the need to say anything that hasn't been said? I noticed that there was some a question in the chat. I'm not sure if it got addressed already about the, the garage door ratio. And I did, I mean, I did my own little back of the envelope math and it seems like it all was in compliance. But Carolyn, do you need, do we, are we good on that issue? Yeah, I mean, I explained it. I also want to explain that we're, we, um, should not be taking any comments through chat. All the comments have right. to be through I know, I just, verbally. Yeah. So, um, and I didn't, um, I had um, 
failed to turn off the chat before the first person just popped in. So um, I let that cat out of the bag. Um, so yes, that the um, the calculations um, you know are met. Yeah. Thanks. All right. If there are if there's no further discussion, if in fact that's correct. Uh, by the board, we, I guess, is that, is that correct? Um, yeah, okay. and I don't know if you want me to go over, I know they sent the DPW <coughs> comments um, and we talked a little bit about them. I think a lot of them relate to just um, cleaning up the plans um, and there are some stand other issues about um, doing installing tree protection and and I, in my staff memo, I had some proposed conditions as well. Um, so, and I don't know if you are wanting to have more discussion about the, you know, each of you, the, the merits of the site plan. Again, it's site plan approval. This is a use that's allowed um, by right. And there's not the same discretion that a special permit carries. Um, it requires the, um, um, a uh, vote by a um, simple majority, so that's four of the seven members um, to approve a site plan. Um, and really, if you deny the site plan, you need to specify exactly why on technical grounds it's not meeting the zoning, um, because the underlying use is allowed. It's really just how the use functions on the site and whether it functions on the site. So um, just um, know that that's sort of, that's the platform from which you're, you know, making your decision. Um, let's see, just one thing. I, I hate to raise a new issue at five after 10, you know, knowing me, um, but in your proposed conditions, uh, uh, Carolyn, you say no dumpster shall be located on the site. We haven't even touched on that. I'm not sure. That means that each of the six units will have to drive their trash someplace. That's a lot of driving, a lot of a lot of transportation. I, I don't exactly see the point of that. And and it's not wherever it would be located. It would be way off the street and out of the public view. I, I don't. Well, see I think the point. issue, right, Alan, is 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 not having trucks go up that. Um, that driveway they I, they still could have bins to, to bring down to the the road to the to the road okay well the, the issue is is right is sort of minimizing the total number of vehicles that are on the road but also it's not shown on the plan so you don't you're approving the plans that are presented and there's no dumpster pad so you haven't evaluated how that would function so i just thought that it would make sense to be clear that unless they were to come back for an amendment saying here's where we want to put a dumpster location and it's few enough units where people can take their own stuff um, up to Locust Street or wherever they want to take it or they could take it out to William Street where I'm sure a lot of people in the neighborhood um, roll out their items um, on whatever schedule they're on. Just Is there any restriction? Would that? there be any restrictions? Sorry. So, okay, so we don't have to impose a condition to that effect because it's not on the plan and we're approving the plan. I mean, if we approve. True. It. Yep. Right. All right. So, is, are we ready for an up or down vote on the application? And, and how, yeah. I'm wondering if we want to have any discussion. There's been a lot of discussion about general feelings about density and affordability and luxury or whatever, but uh, there hasn't been any discussion about the the number one topic uh, on these meetings usually, which is guest parking. Uh, and uh, it seems to me like you know there's a fair amount of paved area. I scratch my head a little bit about you know only having garage spaces for the owners. There seems to be a lot of locations where just de facto areas are just going to become guest parking, which is, you know, maybe that's fine. I don't know. Um, I just didn't know if that's something we want to discuss at all um, because that, that is something that could have some kind of impact uh, or, or, or 
my worry is actually that it would become an impact when there's guests parked where like the fire truck is supposed to turn around or something like that. Um, uh, Mr. Sharp, is there provision for Well, you, you already parking? closed the public hearing, yeah. oh, so I'm sorry. Yeah, um, right. I can explain that, um, first of all, as you know, you, the zoning does not require guest parking. Um, I think it's true, it's possible that the fire trucks uh, I mean that someone could park in the overflow um, or the turnaround for the um, emergency services. Those vehicles are equipped with reverse gears, <laughs> um, so if they had to, they could back up. <laughs> um, and I I think that there are also the some of the driveways that go into the garages have extra length, so yeah. you can park behind the garages, so that's extra space. Um, so it is sort of the plans do show some ability to have um, additional parking um, off of the driveway. I, I, I support this because it's, I feel like it's fully within the rules and what we're, what we're, what we've been asked to support. I, I do think that the, the only problem I have with it, and I don't think that this is the right time to deal with it, but is that this is considered a driveway. I'm sorry, 300 feet with multiple properties off of it is not a driveway, it's a road. And I think that, like, but if, but if, this, if the rules say that it's a driveway, then it's a driveway. But this is not, this is being fully treated as a road. And, um, and I, I just don't, but within the rules, it, I, I believe that it should be approved. All right. Do we have a motion? Would it be Caroline, oh, go ahead. I just, you'd mentioned the, we talked about the DPW conditions. You had some other recommendations. We've talked about at least one of them. I would like to hear the rest of them so that we don't sure. miss out on them. Yeah. Yeah. And you really need to include all of them in a motion if you want them to be part of the permit. Um, so I, you know, these incorporate the DPW um, uh, comments as well as um, originally my um, recommendations um, that I sent to you previously. Um, but to prior to any construction that um, final revised uh, plans be submitted 30 days of, ahead of issuance of any city building or construction plans and incorporate um, the modifications to the plans just to, it, some of the plan sets don't match up with um, text um, call outs and that kind of thing. So clean up the plans um, that um, the, um, a, a revised a &R plan should be submitted that shows the um, the property boundary. There was some discussion between the boundary, where the boundary was with the dike. Um, the, um, an easement plan for the sewer line should be um, finalized and recorded prior to construction. Um, a stormwater operations and maintenance plan should be um, recorded and executed as uh, presented in the um, stormwater management um, application or plan. Um, perennials and shrubs should only be planted in the storm drain easement um, that uh, there should be no snow storage within the bioretention area. Um, uh, drainage calculation should be revised to be consistent with the plan submitted um, for the stormwater system to DPW. Uh, test pits should be completed um, to confirm that the um, soils are as assumed for the bioretention areas and the perimeter drains. Um, and that all tree protection should be installed and inspected by the planning office before construction begins. And then prior to a certificate of occupancy, um, the applicant should show the removal of um, 
that the removal of the bay projection at 30 Williams it has been completed and that easements for the shared driveway uh, for maintenance responsibilities shall be recorded. Traffic mitigation in the amount of $6,000 should be paid. Um, we didn't talk about this, but the lighting plan shows um, um, lighting that's in compliance with the zoning. Um, and I had recommended that the post lights be on some kind of timer to go off at midnight or be on some kind of motion sensor so they're not on all night. Um, I don't know if the board wants to talk about that, whether they feel that's necessary. Um, the light levels are fairly low, so maybe you don't feel like it's necessary. Um, but those are the sort of the, the last ones that I had on my list. Yes, about the lights, one thought, uh, with, with a curved driveway, a curved long driveway like this, if someone comes back home at one in the morning, might be good for them to have some illumination. I, I would think we should leave it alone. I agree that lighting is important for safety. I think I would sort of are on the side of um, motion sensors in part also because of use of um, the dike and, and, and different kinds of uses of the space around there that, um, you know, that, that seems most appropriate to both this site and uh, sort of abutting uses. I agree with that. Okay, so motion sensors. Are we ready to move to a vote? Somebody want to make a motion with all of that? I, I'm going. I'm going to try. <laughs> uh, I move to approve the application uh, for a site plan for construction of six units and a shared driveway between two lots by uh, P. Tush LLC at 30 William Street, Map ID 32C26 eight and 356 with conditions so stated by Carolyn. Move like that. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Who's that, Krista? Melissa, who said that? Krista. 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 Okay. All right. Uh, is there any discussion? Yes, we've done it. Okay, let's take a vote. Uh, Jana? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Marissa? Yes. Krista? Yes. David? Yes. Alan? Yes. Okay, the application Sam. is approved uh, with uh, all of uh, Carolyn's conditions uh, and provisions. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Sharp. Thank you. Vote yes, too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, I know this You're well, not so. on my, Sam, I don't see you on my screen for some it's a, reason. It's okay. It's okay. I know you, I know you love me, Alan. Yeah, right. Yes. <laughs> Sam, what do you vote? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> all right. Well, we can all, oh, wait, we have some uh, ANRs. Um, yep. There's one ANR. Uh, let me just go to that. Uh, um, I'm going to share my screen so you can see it. Um, where's that? Here we go. Can you see this? It's on Swan Street. Um, actually on the corner of Hubbard and Swan. And it's really just a land swap between two abutters um, to acknowledge and uh, the actual use of the property by each of those um, abutters. So that parcel A is being used by number 15, but, um, and parcel B um, is sort of being used by the corner lot. So they're just doing a swap here um, and there's no new lot being created. All right, do we have a motion? I move to approve the A&R. That must be Sam. <laughs> I second. 
And Second. I'm Marissa. Marissa. Um, okay, so uh, Jana? Yes. Marissa? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Sam? Yes. David? Yep. And Krista and Alan? Yes, yes. Okay. Can we go home? Uh, then there's just minutes from the 27th. I approve the minutes. They were great. Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't we I second vote on, that we approve the minutes. Couldn't we double up a vote on two things? They're two different things. <laughs> yeah, but they're all related. <laughs> but in the meantime, okay. Sam moved that we approve them, and I seconded. So let's. <laughs> all right. So let's go, Jana. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Marissa. Yes. David. Yep. Krista. Yep. Sam. Alan. Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. Now we can go home. I move we adjourn. I second that. The only thing now we don't have to vote on that, do we? We do. Yeah. We do. Really? Yeah. yeah. What if we all just turn off our computers? <laughs> That's what Alan normally does. <laughs> right. Yeah, whether I intend to or not. All, all right. right. Jana. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Marissa. Yes. David. Yep. Krista. Yep. Sam. Yes. Sam. <laughs> Alan. Yep. <laughs>